It will not be a surprise to any of you that I'm making a video today talking about the life of the mind. You might be wondering how I'm possibly going to justify the title of this video, however, mentioning Aaron Janis, Nina and Randa in the same sentence as the life of the mind. Just two days ago, there was a very memorable broadcast from Aaron Janice's Instagram. About 100 other human beings witnessed this along with myself. She commented during this broadcast that somebody somewhere should record it and download it. I don't think anyone did. Uh, Aaron attended a political protest and she engaged in ranting and exhortations that I could best compare to the presidential campaign of Kanye West. If you're not familiar with this genre, um, you could look up right now and come back to the channel. Uh, Kanye West slavery rant at TMZ offices. Uh, it was this level of incoherence. And let's be clear. What we're talking about is a combination of ignorance, stupidity, self-righteousness, and almost messianic self-confidence, a sense of purpose and objective. That they're not just saying something. You know, being stupid happens to people. <laughs> being ignorant happens to us all. We're all born ignorant. And if you don't have any real experience of being stupid, you probably just don't have a very good memory because we've all been through that too. But the combination of that with this messianic ranting sense of self-confidence, that's what brings back for me memories of Kanye West and witnessing this, uh, I don't know, monologue. It wasn't even monologue. She was talking to other protesters at this protest. This very, very strange broadcast from Aaron Janice. Now, not surprisingly, many people in that audience, audience of about 100 people, they don't know Aaron the way I do. And you guys may have guessed, as much as I have criticized Aaron on this channel, I've also respected her privacy. That's true of everybody. That's true even of Durian Ryder and Freely. I know private things about them I've never said on the internet, and I never would say. I have my own code of honor about these things. A lot of people in the audience do not know Aaron the way I know Aaron. And they were insisting that she was high on drugs during the protest. So many people were saying this. And some of them were like attributing their conclusion to particular things. One guy was saying, look at her tongue. Someone else said, oh, you can tell by her eyelid movement or something. No, no, she, this, this is her in a manic state on a, you know, high on drugs. And, you know, I was trying to find a nice way to say it. And I, I think I did. I didn't say anything offensive. But I, I wrote a comment saying, no, guys, if you know Aaron, this, this is what she's like, stone cold sober. This is her sober with no makeup and no hair. I don't mean no hair in the sense. <laughs> no, no, uh, no effort put into her hair and makeup. This is the real Aaron Janice. This is what she's what she's like. So she, by the way, she responded to that. She wasn't really offended, but she insisted in response to some of those comments in the audience that no, she uh, she wasn't on any drugs and she hadn't, she wasn't hung over and wasn't high enough. Now You know, a man slipping on a banana peel in a vacuum is not comedy. You know, what makes it funny is the context you place that in. You know, so if it is the president of the United States who has just been lecturing the vice president, and we know in the audience the vice president is actively engaged in a plot to assassinate the president of the United States in order to replace him. This is, a, this, is a, this is a tremendously tense uh, situation and exactly the issue they disagree on, which is the reason for the plot. Uh, this is what they're confronting each other about in a hall hallway with tremendous seriousness. And then the president slips on a banana peel. And then he begins furiously pointing at his different aides and demanding to know, who ate this banana? Okay. Now you've got comedy. Right, it's the it's the contrast between these incongruous elements. Now, what makes this example of Aaron Janus worth talking about today, whether you think of it as comic or tragic, frankly, um, it isn't just that she's stupid. It isn't just that she's slipping on a banana peel. It isn't just that she's ignorant. It isn't just that she's wrong. 
you know, the tragedy from my perspective is you can see she's really reaching out for the meaning of life. She is reaching out to have a more meaningful life. And the reason why she's at this political protest and the way in which she's reaching out to and talking to these other protesters and the way in which she's reaching out to the audience, this is someone who wants to have a meaningful life. And the meaning of life and living a meaningful life, it has everything to do with politics at every scale. I was just saying to my girlfriend earlier today, I've started learning Spanish. I'm at level zero in Spanish. So I'm thinking more about places like Mexico that weren't on my mind so much. lately. Mexico, in terms of its climate and geography, ought to be paradise. It ought to be one of the most wonderful places on this earth you could possibly live. Um, I could say the same about Malaysia. I could say the same about Indonesia. Why don't you want to retire in Indonesia? Why don't you want to go on vacation to Malaysia? <laughs> How do you feel about Mexico? Okay. The reason why Mexico is not paradise is political. It's political and cultural. You may feel powerless at first when you're thinking about politics and culture. But the main message of my channel again and again and again, is that what you have power over is the culture of one. It's the politics of one. One person, you. Political change begins with you. And even if it ends with you, even if your pico culture, <laughs> pico culture meaning something much, much smaller than a subculture, even if your pico culture and even if your political movement has no adherence except you yourself by striking out in your own direction this way, by deciding to live your own life and your own terms politically and culturally, rather than compromising with, rather than living a life that's derivative of the, the politics and culture that, that surround you, right? That's how you secure for yourself you know, the way to a meaningful life. You may not have the option of leaving Indonesia you were born and raised in Indonesia. The only language you can speak is Bahasa Indonesia, this kind of thing. You, financially, whether you were born in Indonesia, you were born in Malaysia, you were born in Mexico, and you may well say you don't have the power or the talent or the resources to transform the culture of this nation of millions of people that surrounds you. Right. And I don't have the power or resources to transform Canada. I don't... I don't think I can influence the future of Canada, even as much as I can influence the future in politics of Laos, a tiny communist dictatorship I used to I used to live in. Oliver was asking me that the other day. I, I had a little bit of influence in Laos, partly because it was just such a tiny, such a tiny country. Um, you could meet people in government pretty easily there. Um, you know, I may be completely powerless, right? But it begins with the politics of one. It begins with the culture of one. It begins with you and how you're going to live your life. Now, I've got to say, the only area of discourse I know where people speak in these terms is fashion. People talk about being a fashion victim as opposed to having your own style. You know, that you are someone who doesn't choose to follow fashion you are asserting what ought to be in fashion by the clothes you wear. And, you know, I mean, there are people like this. There are people who are, quote, unquote, taste makers rather than followers. Now, obviously, fashion is the most shallow and insipid nonsense. And why bother? But I'm pointing out, um, you know, I don't know of any discourse like that that even extends to reading books, <laughs> you know, that no, 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 really, you shouldn't be reading the best selling books or the most popular books, or the books that other people think are interesting or profound, or even the other books people think are politically important. That actually, in the same way that you should be someone who sets the trend, someone who changes fashion, someone who challenges fashion with your own sense of style, you know, that you should in the same way be challenging the norm in your in your culture and by the way you should be doing it even when it involves taking risks um there was a time when having spiky hair was a kind of risk and an act of rebellion as stupid as that now sounds 
I don't know, maybe somewhere in the world, certainly in Myanmar. Myanmar, the government's very restrictive about men's hairstyles. One example is this. Maybe there is still somewhere. I, I hate to use the term because it is somewhat racist, but you know, the Mohawk hairstyle, for example. You know, there was a time when this this was what job could you possibly have if you had a Mohawk? Perhaps today it's the opposite. Perhaps many jobs require you to have a Mohawk as a as a hairstyle. But you know, uh, this is I'm pointing out this is an incredibly shallow theater or uh, workshop for cultural change or a laboratory. For culture, you think of it as, as a set of experiments, right? A laboratory for cultural change, the world of fashion, the world of style, the world of trends. Well, why is it we think so little about this outside of that strange, uh, shallow world? You know, we have this great term to be a fashion victim, to be a victim of what happens to be in, in fashion. What's, what's the opposite of that? fashion hero <laughs> you know we don't have a concept of being an intellectual victim of being a political victim of being a cultural victim that's exactly what you are to be honest all of us up to a certain age and a certain stage you know that's that's what we were and there was a stage in which I had no idea how to live a meaningful life. I had no idea how to educate myself about politics and nobody else was going to help me. I had no idea how to be an intellectual. I remember Oliver, Oliver's in the audience now. Oliver was shocked when I told him. This is this is many decades ago. It's sort of in the 1980s. Uh, I remember watching uh, the films of Woody Allen. Woody Allen made some relatively pretentious, relatively intellectual films with little little bits of political commentary. Because I was trying to figure out what, what do real intellectuals do? Real intellectuals watch and appreciate the films of Woody Allen. <laughs> Quite a number of French and uh, Italian avant-garde filmmakers I also, I also watched that time in my life. And it's all garbage. I mean, like in this sense, I was a, I was a fashion victim. You know, how, how are you going to figure out? Uh, this came up the other day for totally ridiculous reasons. Both Melissa and a friend of mine on Instagram uh, were asking me about uh, my history with chess. Yeah, I do have a history with actually formally studying chess and playing chess. I figured out it's no different from a video game. <laughs> I really don't regard chess as any more intellectually sophisticated than playing Virtua Fighter 2. I, I didn't say Virtua Fighter 1. I said Virtua Fighter 2, guys. <laughs> it's, it's a more sophisticated game than Virtua Fighter 1. You know, um, so, you know, this this ended up with me, you know, abandoning chess as vanity of vanities. But no, why did I why did I get involved with chess? Right. There was this compelling cultural illusion. This is what this is what men of genius do. Even, you know, this is what people with real intellectual refinement do, that they sit down and, and play chess. Uh, now, you know, there were many others. I mean, also the idea that a real intellectual smoked cigarettes and drank alcohol. Was very much built into the culture, and at that time, I have to say, chess was politicized. In the 1980s, the face-off between the Soviet Union and the United States of America, there was really the sense that there were the the geniuses representing the Soviet Union, representing communism, and the geniuses representing Western democracy, and they came together to play chess to decide <laughs> who had more geniuses. I guess you know, um, just as in our times, people come together to play Street Fighter V and uh, Call of Duty, and uh, Rainbow Six, uh, just as in our times, uh, World of Warcraft, and other fine, fine games determine the future and fate of nations. You guys may not know, but there's, there's a very, very famous, um, very, very famous ping pong match in the history of China that was very important uh, politically for the history of China and the United States. P and people used to use the terms ping pong diplomacy and ping pong politics. But if you said that today, people would assign some other meaning to it. Okay, so, you know, you look at someone like uh, Aaron Janus, and I'll tell you how I feel about it. And, you know, I, I may be wrong on this. On this particular issue, I may be wrong. When I look at Aaron Janus, when I look at Nina and Randa, I don't see someone who is biologically different from me. I don't see someone who is doomed by fate or by an innate biological condition to forever be uh, intellectually inferior. I don't. Now, you know, maybe I'm wrong. You know, in the case of uh, Nina and Randa, 
they could have any number of health conditions they've never disclosed to the public. I can imagine they have any number of disabilities. You know, it's it's possible they have some kind of serious learning disability I don't know about. But even then, many of the learning disabilities of our time are medically unreal. And there are a lot of diagnoses in our time, like depression, um, that are popular but have, have no scientific basis, roughly speaking. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, in this very simple sense, at this stage, I have to disclaim, maybe I'm wrong. And, you know, I think some people uh, could write in who have real disabilities and could talk about, look, I appreciate this philosophy or you're preaching, but there's no way they can practice it because they, they really are born with some combination of, you know, debilitating uh, health problems or, or physical, physically real medical abnormalities. I had one longtime viewer of the channel who had uh, an abnormality in her brain that showed up on x-rays and MRI scan. And it was slowly killing her too. <laughs> she talked about her struggle to lead a life of the mind and to be an intellectual with a, a very real um, physical impairment. So it exists. Um, and as I've mentioned many times, I do have one half brother who was born severely mentally disabled. And I, I understand, I mean, in his case, it's, it's brain damage. You know, in the simplest sense, there's a sense in which, you know, you, you this advice <laughs> to say it falls on deaf ears is, is an understatement. It's, it's something that's not going to be applicable to everyone's life. But I've got to tell you, um, whether we're talking about males or females on YouTube, most of these people I really do regard as my equals. I regard them as people who were born with, in this sense, as much innate capacity, ability, talent as I had. And one of the reasons for that is I remember how stupid I was. Okay. I remember what it was like being stupid and ignorant and brainless. I, I, I'm not, I, mean, I think a lot of people get deluded about that. They get deluded, deluded about the progress they made and, and how they, they made it. Like I can say to you straight up, there was a time when I was as stupid as Nina and Aranda, you know, I grew out of it. <laughs> And part of what we're talking about here is simply the question of why they haven't. Now, I'm going to deal with something at this stage that I don't want the whole video to be about. If you guys ask, and we can talk about whatever you guys ask questions about, whatever your, whatever your own concerns or problems are, frankly, in living the meaningful life. We're going to read this to you from a really lousy translation of Seneca. This is the ancient uh, Roman philosopher and playwright, really is a playwright, Seneca. I, I've warned you already. Translate The translation is lousy. Greetings from Seneca to his friend Lucillus. Continue to act thus, my dear Lucillus. Set yourself free for your own sake. Gather and save your time, which till lately has been forced from you or filched away or has merely slipped from your hands. Make yourself believe the truth of my words, that certain moments are torn from us, that some are gently removed, and that others glide beyond our reach. The most disgraceful kind of loss, however, is that due to carelessness. Furthermore, if you will pay close attention to the problem, you will find that the largest portion of our life passes while we are, while we are doing ill. I don't like the, doing ill. This could be better translated, but I continue. A goodly share, sorry, terrible use of English language here, but anyway. <laughs> a goodly share while we are doing nothing. And the whole while we are doing that which is not to our purpose. What man can you show me who places any value on his time, who reckons the worth of each day, who understands that he is dying daily? For we are mistaken when we look forward to death. The major portion of death has already passed. Whatever years behind us are in death's hands. Therefore, Lucillus, do as you write me that you are doing. Hold every hour in your grasp. Lay hold of today's task, and you will not need to depend so much upon tomorrow's. While we are, pardon me, while we are postponing, life speeds by. Nothing, Lucillus, is ours except time. I, I can go on. We are entrusted by nature with the ownership of this single thing so fleeting and slippery that anyone who can will oust us from its possessions. Pardon me. So I did read uh, 
Seneca when I was very young. And I was so young that I'm aware that I've forgotten it. Um, I should I should make time. I really don't have time to do more of this reading now. If I reread Seneca, I will probably have to examine the extent to which all of my later philosophy was actually influenced by Seneca, by that one author. I think in, in many people, back when I was engaging in debates about video game addiction and quitting video games, I think many people were just astonished at my attitude towards time. Well, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> Mm. And, you know, I, I mean, it's easy for me to say I've always been like this. Well, when did I first form that idea about time? <laughs> it's very painful for me to remember, to be honest with you. I can remember when my attitude changed. And it's, 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 it's not something I like to think about. Um, but there you go. There's one touchstone in my intellectual development. And someone else who, you know, again, it's not... <laughs> <laughs> that's largely stated in terms of regret of looking back on your life and realizing to what extent you you squandered the opportunities that you had. I raise it here for this reason. You know, with the exception of people who have innate disabilities that really impair them intellectually, I do actually think of myself as equal to other people, not as being born with some special advantage. For that same reason, I take it very seriously when people make the decision to own a dog. Now, there are two things here. How much time and how much money do you think it takes to be an intellectual? How much time and how much money do you think it takes to, to uh, develop in this way? Obviously, Nina and Randa have the time. <laughs> Obviously, Nina and Randa have the money. They're wealthy and leisured people. But not everyone is in Nina and Randa's position. Not everyone is in Aaron Genesis' position, you know, admittedly. Um, if you own a dog, some people in this audience own several dogs. Have you ever thought about putting a clock on how much time goes into that dog? You probably wouldn't be able to measure it in one day or one week or one month. You'd probably have to measure it over a whole year. How often do you shampoo the dog? How often do you get its hair cut? How often do you take it to the vet? How often do you walk it, feed it, pick up its poo? You know. A lot of stages go into caring for just one pet. There are other reasons why I'm morally opposed to pet ownership, by the way. So, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. So, like cleaning up after the pet, like when they make, uh, yeah, so you see, Melissa knows. Um, so, yeah, I, I knew a guy, uh, he was a bodybuilder, he was a vegan bodybuilder, and he cleaned all of the fur out of his whole apartment every day, first thing in the morning. He had this completely spotless apartment. He was he was a very heterosexual guy. I mean, a lot of what he talked to me about when he thought he was out chasing women. But I remember saying to him, look, I've seen those pictures of your apartment. I understand why there's this rumor that you're secretly gay. Because it's so, it's so clean. It's so tight. Like the way you keep your, it's just mind one. And he talked, he, he replied, he talked me through his schedule. And he cleaning up the fur, cleaning up the mess. You know, they they break things. Okay. Um, I wouldn't be talking about this if I think it, if I thought it didn't make a difference, if I thought some people are just born with no talent and are doomed and determined to be idiots their whole lives. And again, I've already made the concession. You know, some people are so severely retarded. Some people are born mentally impaired where their, their options are very limited in life. I get it. But with that aside, um, whether you're talking about Aaron Janice, Nina and Aranda, or, you know, Ali Hardesty, another YouTuber I've commented on or Anissian or anyone else, you know, you think, you think it doesn't matter this time you're putting into uh, taking care of a, taking care of a dog. And again, something you do every day. So it takes at least minutes, if not hours out of your day, every day. And I see it here. Yeah. Sorry. I just, I see people who are putting in the time, walk their dog multiple times per day, every day. You know, we, we see that surrounding us, that, that kind of culture. Well, what if you spent those minutes developing your mind, pursuing the life of the mind? I don't even have to have to fill it in for you. You know, now many video games today, not all, many, they'll actually give you a clock. I mean, it's, it, 
it's surprising that so many video game programmers do that because I mean it must discourage people from playing games that when you log in and log out, because you've played this game for three hours today and a total of 300 hours this year. You know, like it must, some people must feel guilty looking at that. I don't know, must regret what they're doing at the time. Well, you don't get a clock on walking your dog, right? Now, another one, keeping it all the way real, you don't get a clock on quarreling with your girlfriend, quarreling with your boyfriend. I've been through some relationships, you know, and all the hours you're putting into talking to this person about their emotional problems or just who does the dishes, whatever you, whatever you fight over, whatever you quarrel over, you know what I mean? If you put a clock on that, right? Well, you could be developing yourself more. Again, I, if, if I were a fatalist, if I were a pessimist, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think this way. Cause you look at Nina, you look at Randa, you look at Aaron Janice and you just think, Oh, well, that's it. This is the lot you're born to in life. So go ahead, walk your dog, play video games, play uh, Counter Strike Go online, you know, whatever, play speed run Mario 64, <laughs> whatever it is you do. Go ahead and waste your time because there's nothing better you could be doing anyway. There's no, no progress that you're that you're capable of. Now, this live stream from you know Aaron Janice, it brings up a number of other illustrations of what the, the big underlying issues are here. Um, our culture encourages us to be childish our whole lives long. I remember reading a description of Japanese culture from over 100 years ago. I'll just digress to mention, I was very interested in the books that were written by Europeans describing cultures in Asia at an early enough stage that the stereotypes weren't established yet. So to give an example, uh, pe people who came from, I was going to say people who came from the Dutch, people who came from the Netherlands uh, to Sri Lanka, their encounter with Sri Lanka at that stage, you know, and they didn't have any preformed notion of what, you know, the people or culture of Sri Lanka are like their description of it. I, I read a little bit from the Portuguese. At that time, there wasn't that much available in English translation, and I couldn't read Portuguese. Portuguese explorers, but the very first British people and so on to set foot in some of these places and encounter the culture and how they described it and how they reacted to it. And also to describe the, the politics, by the way, you know, and to describe the religion, Buddhism, and so on. What was that outsider's perspective at that stage before those, those stereotypes had been formed? Anyway, I remember reading... Um, a description of Japan, and it wasn't it wasn't that ancient. This one it was more than hundred years ago. And this guy uh, said of the Japanese, you know, um, they are doomed to imitate us in all of our excesses. No other culture uh, could be more childish, and no other culture could be more obsessed with playing at being serious, sober, mature, and profound. <laughs> This description of the playfulness of Japanese culture and the childlike quality of Japanese that you're encouraged to be like a child your whole life. Now today on the internet, you know, today with the, the availability of Japanese pop culture, you know, in the West, it's easy to see. But this is at a time when Japan had no electricity yet. You know, this is just kind of amazing. And also the fact that his judgment was that the Japanese were going to imitate everything going on in Europe and the Western world. Like, wow. This guy had their number. This guy showed up in Japan, evaluated the whole uh, the whole culture. Anyway, it's it's interesting. These are not really not explorers. You know, you're past the exploration stage. These are people who are going and really uh, doing kind of anthropology, uh, extra muros kind of thing. Anthropology, not pardon me, anthropology not defined as such. You know, um, you know it is a little bit different for a man and a woman. It's a little bit different if you're beautiful or plain, if you're handsome or ugly, you know? So I hesitate to say, especially for good looking women, but there is this tremendous cultural pressure on you to be childish. You are encouraged and rewarded for being childish. Um, partly because it makes other people feel safe, you know? Um, it makes other people feel relaxed, it makes other people feel that there are no expectations on them. And if you go around in this culture being a serious intellectual, well, I could digress into how badly you're treated, even at Cambridge University, 
even at Oxford University, even at London School of Economics, certainly at the University of Toronto and the terrible universities I've spent time at here. You know, why can't you just relax, bro? I mean, everyone else is just here to party. Everyone else is just here to live lives of uh, live a life of totally reckless, self-indulgent, totally brainless self-indulgence. That's what most people are doing on university campuses, even the most elite and most expensive. And if you're the one guy who's actually living life an intellectual, a lot of people react to that negatively. <laughs> um, I'll be interested to hear if Switzerland turns out to be any different, Oliver. <laughs> uh, as the years go by, maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll get a contrasting perspective, and maybe we'll get a nah, It's just I know the Swiss like to drink too. The Swiss also know how to know how to party. But you know, my feeling about many of these people. Um, and I would include men like James Aspie in this. You know, it's not just women. I can include men like James Aspie. I can include men like Anissia and I can include all kinds of men. But, you know, for our, for our purposes here, when you look at Aaron Janis, when you look at um, Nina and Aranda, I see people who have been encouraged to keep this childlike behavior, childlike insouciance, including, you know, singing and dancing on the internet like you're a child, you know, really childish, childlike activity, being encouraged and being and being rewarded. And then you come up to this breaking point. You know, you come up to this breaking point in your life where under whatever circumstance, either by your own choice, your own volition, or due to circumstances beyond your control, it's put upon you that you suddenly have to make the leap to really thinking and talking and acting like an adult thinking and talking and acting like an intellectual, like a person of real substance. So, you know, Aaron Janice, nobody else was filming her to embarrass her. She's embarrassing herself. She's the one filming and broadcasting this. And here she is holding forth on 20th century politics. And what, what am I going to say just to summarize what she was going to she was, she was claiming that there's nuclear war coming that there's about to be a nuclear war with China. Uh, she's talking about politics between Russia and the United States. She she was nattering as incoherently as Kanye West, but she was covering the big issues in, in politics. Now, I've got to say something. I'm not saying this to insult uh, Aaron. I'm not. I have met people at Cambridge University, England, who were just as ignorant as that, people who were in the PhD program. Some of them had just finished the PhD program. I have met people at that same level of ignorance, master's degree and PhD at elite universities. And I have met people stupider than that, elite level, MA, PhD, university. And I have met people crazier than that. Um, to what extent craziness comes into it? You know, kind of a complicating factor. And um, interesting question as to what extent what we're talking about here maybe stupidity and ignorance, maybe they look a lot like insanity. Just when you have someone who's only prepared to behave and act like a child in a culture that encourages childishness and childlike behavior, and then all of a sudden there are adult expectations, there were intellectual expectations. You know, why can't you step up? You know, well, we all know why you can't step up, right? Like we say someone is an idiot. We talk about being an idiot, but it's a process more than it's a product. You act like an idiot now because you have been living like an idiot for the past five years. And just to bring Nina and Rand into this, make clear why I'm making this parallelism here. You guys may not know this, but Nina and Rand have been in their own struggle to lead a more meaningful life. They signed up to go back to university. They're identical twins. One of them was clear that what she wanted to do was psychology. The other one wasn't clear what her major was going to be at all. They made a whole bunch of videos saying, okay, they decided they're motivated. They're going back to university. They're going to hit the books. By the way, they dropped out of university in the past, both of them. And, you know, mysteriously, all those YouTube videos have disappeared. If there's still one or two of them up, I apologize. But to my knowledge, they went back and deleted or delisted those YouTube videos. We've never had an explanation for why university just didn't happen. And in terms of timeline, that wasn't um, related to current mask wearing concerns. We'll put it this way to be as vague as possible. 
um, this before um, before these uh, these measures uh, happened that did close down some universities. So I'm sure it's not for that reason. Probably they tried. They found it was all a lot harder than they were expecting it to be, and they got it. Sheer sheer speculation on on my part. And you know we know for a fact that Nina and Randa have heard my critique of them. They've responded to it at different times. I've also had interaction with their father. So Nina and Randa know about my YouTube videos about them. I can't say they've seen every single one, but they've seen enough. They've seen several. And their father knows about it. He's probably watched every single one, just knowing his character. And he's interacted with me. We've had email back and forth, you know, over the years. Father, Their father is also a, a very dark character. Well, so here's another kind of breaking point in your life, right? What did they do with their time for the five years leading up to their attempt to go back to university and hit the books? Well, to my knowledge, they worked as fitness instructors. Um, you know, they did these sexually provocative videos on YouTube. My normal example is the lick my body challenge, uh, the twin yoga challenge, the twister challenge. You know, they did that was their period of popularity and success. Their YouTube channel now is a, you know, it's a ghost town. I mean, it's, it's a failure now. But, you know, in the past, when they were successful, it was doing these sexually provocative videos, very often in collaborations on other people's channels. They spent their time singing songs and doing dances and doing fitness instruction and talking about the, the food they eat and talking about how to cure your act. They live these really brainless, childlike lives. And right now, they are about 29 years old. If they're still 28, so I don't know their exact birthday, 28, 29. And they're looking ahead to turning 30. And I get it. They tried to go back to university. And they can't go back. They're not intellectually prepared. They're not, I would say, emotionally prepared. I think they're not even ethically prepared. They, there are ethical components, you know. To life of mind. Well, again, it's not just that they are idiots. You know, it's not just that they are stupid. They're acting like idiots because that's all they've been practicing. You know what I mean? For five years, you've been living like an idiot. You've been choosing to live this way. And now here are the consequences. And they're probably consequences nobody ever talked through with you. Nobody ever said to you, look, if you keep living in a childish way this way, one day you're going to wake up and you're 29 years old and you realize not just that you are an idiot, you don't know how to be anything else. You know? Um, oh, anyway, they have things in common. Uh, sorry. Uh, there's another example I want to bring in here. If you guys don't know who Matt Dillahunty is, um, I've made several videos crit criticizing Matt Dillahunty. Matt Dillahunty, he is considered an intellectual. So there, the irony is, is very different. Um, from my perspective, he's an imbecile, but people people do not admire Matt Dillahunty because of his body, uh, nor because of his singing ability. Both Aaron Janis and Nina Miranda come out of a musical background. This may also be an issue, maybe part of their downward spiral, so to speak, part of what, what led them up to this point in their lives. And by the way, these are these women are all about the same age. So Aaron Ballpark, same same age as Nina Miranda. Sorry, sorry if I'm off by a couple years. Some of that. Um, but she'll also be looking forward towards 30. Uh, soon enough. So sorry, if she's actually 27, I apologize, but not, not, not far off in, in age and all prominent leaders in the vegan movement. Well, I'll tell you something very interesting about Matt Dillahunty. It's always just been astounding to me how ignorant he is, how clueless he is, how uh, immature he is. I, you know, Why would you be surprised by someone being stupid? Well, in his case, he's been a major leader in the atheist movement for like 15 years. So, you know, like even if even if he started off being an idiot, it's kind of like, well, yeah, but you've had years and years to work on this. You've had years and years in the spotlight with a lot of kind of encouragement. And, you know, you've had every opportunity to develop yourself intellectually, even if it's just over the last 15 years and not over the whole 50 odd years of his of his life. You know what it is? Video games. Matt Dillahunty was a ranking league player of competitive video games already in the 1990s. He has been a lifelong video game addict and still as an old man now. He live streams himself playing video games for many hours. And for him, it's especially the so-called first-person shooter, 
where you're walking around and shooting people in the head again, again, again. This is somebody's put all these hours into, into video games. It's a lot. So, sorry, you know, when you think about it in terms of time, I can't say everybody has the time necessary. I can't say everybody has the talent necessary. Most of us do. The vast majority of us, whether you're looking at the video game habit in your life or the dog you're taking for a walk and picking up the poo after, you know, most of us really do have room in our schedule we could make uh, for the life of the mind. And I'm going to go on to talk about some commitments in the life of the mind are incredibly time consuming. Learning a foreign language, especially a, a really alien language like uh, Cree, Ojibwe, Chinese, Japanese, Thai, Laotian, Cambodian. Uh, it, it, a huge number of hours can just go into learning one uh, foreign language. That can take all the time you've got. But by the same token, having just one girlfriend can take all the time and energy you've got. And some of you have two girlfriends and three girlfriends. You know what I mean? Uh, like, you know, there, there are other things that are going to kind of do that. I'd remind you guys, some of you will remember this and some of you won't. Um, it was a, an unintentionally hilarious video attacking me. Um, uh, so this is an obscure YouTuber and I somehow found the video and I think I used a clip of it in a video on my own channel. So this is a couple months ago and this is a British guy. It was a guy with a British accent and he was attacking me because he felt my criticism of video games was unreasonable. And the main thing he was pointing out was that I had music from video games in my video saying that you shouldn't uh, play video games, therefore, my argument It was an incredibly stupid argument. But I'm sorry, I don't know how much of this was in the, the video as I edited it. or I forget if I shared the link on Patreon or what. But, you know, the main thing this guy attacked me for, I, I wouldn't be surprised if when he's off camera, he's anti-Semitic, because it really sounded like the standard anti-Semitic conspiracy theory thing. Um, he was attacking me for being born rich. And claiming that the only reason I was so learned, the only reason I had a university degree, yeah, it's some university degree I've got, let me tell you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. He probably imagines I have some kind of university education I don't have. Um, I have. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Toronto, people. You know, the only reason I'm so erudite and the only reason I've studied these languages and that I know all this ancient history is because my parents are rich and have connections and that they pulled strings. <laughs> To make this possible. Now again, sorry, just his phrasing of it, it did sound like he's been reading some anti-Semitic stuff on Reddit. It sounded like the standard kind of Jewish conspiracy, you know, uh, view of the world. Now there are a lot of things wrong with it, and some of them are really worth unpacking, even just in this limited context. By the way, um, okay, I, I, <laughs> some other people in the vegan community, some other vegan YouTubers have attacked me in those terms, Sometimes it was explicitly anti-Semitic and sometimes implicitly. But yes, many other vegans, um, to name one, one who was really messed up about it, you know, uh, Joe Vegan. He was also British. You know, there's a connection there. I remember he, 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 I think, felt very inferior because of his low level of educational attainment. And um, he really, I, I remember it in emails from him. Um, don't, yeah, I guess we talked about it verbally too over like Skype. You know, um, I remember him really, really in this strange, vitriolic, passionate way saying like, the only reason you've learned Chinese is because your parents are rich. Like they bought that for you, the way your parents buy you a car or something. The only reason you're smarter than me is because you're, you're rich. Or whatever. Now, <laughs> you know, uh, rich men need to understand how poor men work. And poor men need to understand how rich men work. You know, they, the two sides need to understand each other. Um, some people live their lives where they've never really had any rich friends. They've never really had any rich enemies either. It's easy, they dehumanize the rich and they think they live on the other side of this, of this wall, of this gated community. If you'd known any number of rich people, you know, <laughs> do you have any idea how ignorant, how poorly educated, <laughs> how fatuous 99% of rich people are? 
I mean, if you would physically go inside the Ivy Gardens of Cambridge, of Oxford, of Harvard University, you name it, of the most elite universities, even there, that's not all the rich people. Plenty of rich people don't choose to go to those places. But like, you can be in the most elite settings with the most privileged people. And, you know, they, they look up to Kim Kardashian. Like, you know, Kim Kardashian is born rich. You know, there are like the relationship between being rich and the life of the mind. Just if you knew more rich people, you wouldn't think this way. Now, I had one friend who was uh, not Jewish. He had no Jewish background in his family. But I remember he, he, he dealt with plenty of anti-Semitic people. And his favorite method of ridiculing the anti-Semitic people, who very often believe that everyone with Jewish ancestry is a genius, is like, you know, if you took one beach vacation in Tel Aviv, if you would just go to a nightclub in Tel Aviv, Israel, and get to, if you just knew more Jewish people, your illusion that they're all geniuses, that they're all part of this conspiracy, like, you know, this can, this can, this can be challenged just on that empirical basis. Like, if you knew more rich people, you might question the advantages and disadvantages of, of being born rich. Yeah, well, you know, the actual work that's involved, even even with the example of learning Chinese. So it's a great example, but it's, in some ways, it's a unique and misleading example. No, being wealthy, you have no advantage in learning Chinese. <laughs> and spend some time around those people. You can meet a lot of pampered rich kids, and that's exactly what they can't do. You know, they might have a millionaire father who says, hey, look, you know, you've kind of been a lazy waste of space around here. I want you to go and learn Chinese so you can contribute to the family business in the future. Um, that's a lot like Nina and Randa trying to go back to university. That's a lot like Aaron Janis suddenly trying to be a politically well-informed substantive intellectual. You will find that they're often kind of worse prepared, that all they know how to do is be, is be childish. They can't meet the challenge and it, and it falls apart. Um, <laughs> this is, this is one part of it. But the other part, I, 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 uh, I hinted before that I was going to talk about this, you know, being an intellectual, how many hours do you need in the day? Maybe if you just didn't have a dog, maybe the time you were spending walking a dog and grooming a dog and cleaning up dog hair and dog vomit. There you go. You know, that counts. That can really be enough to develop. So the, the amount of time you need, if you really think about it, how much time do you need? If you've got the will, right? Um, well, how much money do you need? There is an author whom I grew up referring to as Henri David Thoreau, but apparently only the Quebecois call him that. Uh, in his own life, apparently, his name, he was called Thoreau. We have names, American names, Thoreau and Thoreau Good and Thoreau, Thoreau this and Thoreau that. So um, his actual name when he was alive was not Thoreau, but uh, Henri David brings out the French, the, brings out the bad French accent in me. To remind you all, this is called Abel le Ciel. I do have a separate channel with a Spanish name, though. I have Derebar el Cielo. There is already a Spanish spinoff for this channel. I'm at, I'm at level zero on Spanish. But I can't conjugate the verb to be or to have. For real. Mm -hmm. Do you have a drink? Do you have a drink? Yes. Yes. Bibis and bibble. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, aesthetically, it's a very appealing language, Spanish, at least on, at least on paper. Um, anyway, so <laughs> how much money does it take to learn Spanish? <laughs> if you think this stuff is the privilege of the rich, you know, so uh, Henri David Thoreau, I remember him lamenting that to buy a serious book in his time was like six months worth of wages for a laborer. Now, in the context of him saying this, he meant something like Thucydides, he meant, uh, hardcover books from ancient Greece and Rome. This is the kind of serious book he was talking about. But um, obviously, it was reflecting on the, the actual uh, wages earned by a farm laborer or something in the part of America he was, he was living. He said, well, obviously, the vast majority of people can't become learned men just because of the cost of books. I remember I was stunned to read that. Where I was in Toronto at this time, this was very much pre-internet. The internet was coming into existence Step by step. There, I had no ability to read a book at that time uh, on a computer, to get a book for free and, and read it. You know? But on, on the one hand, of course, there were libraries. But Toronto at that time was sort of this great center of bargain bin secondhand books. 
and even just mass produced new books that were really, really cheap, you know, $1.99 for a new book. And when you went to, I mean, I'd go to these sales where it was the library getting rid of the books they didn't want anymore. And there were, I've taken Melissa to these. I went to those secondhand bookstores, you know, that I, that I took you to. But at that time, too, probably it's, it's probably because it's before the internet. Now on the internet, those books, I think, are sold more efficiently over different websites, uh, including Amazon, you know, so sold. Uh, but before the internet, all they could do was kind of dump all these books together and, and put them in front of you. And, uh, yeah, I mean, almost everything was just unconscionably cheap. I mean, how could paper be so cheap? And this made me keenly aware. But before I'd read that from Henry David Thoreau, that his reflection on how scarce books were in his own life. And I always looked around thinking like, you know, do you people realize movies were expensive then, going to see a movie in a theater? You know, for the cost of two people going to see a movie, like you could have a whole library of books from the amount of money you spent on one night's entertainment going out to the movies, you know, the movies were a huge waste of a huge waste of money at that time. I don't know if that's gotten better or worse, the cost of actually going to a movie theater and seeing a movie in that, in that format. So, you know, it was just laziness. It was just self-indulgence. You know, money did not come into it. I mean, today, <laughs> even if you don't own a computer, you can download all the greatest works in the history of mankind onto your cell phone. You could, you, you know, um, uh, some of them you can buy for 99 cents. You can, if you want to do it, but well, you know, Project Gutenberg, the availability of, of free e-tests. And, you know, in many of the fields of study I've been in, whether it is Cree, Ojibwe, Chinese, Japanese, Cal uh, <laughs> uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Cambodian, you know, uh, Pali, you name it, all of the best resources were free because all of the best research was done already a hundred years ago. Just being real with you. Like most of the books I really valued, they were not the new expensive books. They were books from at least 50 years ago. Uh, sometimes a hundred years ago. Oh, well, yeah. So there's a, well, this, yeah, this is from, this is from the communist period. Anyway, it's a memorable little book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, you, you, well, babe, I mean, I think you can imagine like with a country like Laos, um, the French colonial period, is what produced these big, gorgeous, impressive books. And that stuff, it would either be public domain or it'd be free or almost free. And also, frankly, India, Sri Lanka, it was basically British Empire books. Anyway, I am I am digressing. But you know, um, the allegation that the life of the mind, that developing yourself intellectually, that this is uh, an elite pastime, in the 21st century, nothing could be further from the truth. I've known a lot of rich people. They grow up lonely. <laughs> they grow up, you know, frankly, more susceptible to and more damaged by drug addiction and alcohol than the poor. You know, uh, most rich people grow up very neglected by their own parents. They grow up being raised by Filipina nannies or other, you know, household servants. Those are the people who cook for them and, and care for them to a limited extent. And they grow up going to schools where everyone else is also a, a rich kid with, you know, flagrant amounts of illegal drug use and drinking and, and, and recklessness and so on. Um, it, it, is, it is very, very rare to meet a wealthy person who has cultivated their mind, who lives a life of the mind in any sense. And, you know, beyond that, and again, these people are hard to meet. If you go out and meet people who really have lived life of the mind, and who have, as I said earlier, they've kind of lived with their own politics, lived with their own culture, the politics of one, the culture of one. If you can ask them politely, to what extent was lack of money an obstacle to you? I'm, I'm being real with you. I think most of the time, most of them say, no, not at all. No, I mean, this, this stuff, it didn't really cost me anything. Um, and, you know, I just say, you know, I have been an intellectual when flat broke. I have literally been an intellectual when I woke up in the morning and chopped firewood and there was no electricity, you know, you, know, you boiled water so you could drink it over, over firewood. I've, I have been an intellectual in conditions of extreme poverty with no, sorry, I think I already mentioned no electricity. It's kind of a big deal. <laughs> and I read with a flashlight uh, zipping up the mosquito netting, you know, 
I have been an actual an intellectual in, in very, very hard conditions. And I've been in an intellectual in conditions where I was poor enough that I really didn't know I was going to pay my rent, you know, two or three months down the road where my life was really an immediate economic struggle that way. I have been an intellectual when I had a newborn baby in my arms. And I was, it was at a certain stage, it was good exercise. It was very muscular, uh, uh, cradling her and getting her to sleep. You guys might think, I mean, it's normally shown on TV as this really, no, it's a big motion. <laughs> um, babies really like to be swung a good long, a good long way in your arms. But, you know, um, I have been an intellectual while caring for a newborn infant. You know what I mean? I've been an intellectual in all kinds of different circumstances, not just the one you see, you know, right now. On your screen and i mean you know <laughs> so i guess i did i'm just being honest with you I, I guess i did buy the cheapest spanish dictionary i possibly could how much better is the dictionary that costs twice as much like you know really i mean, I mean from my obviously it's from my limited perspective as someone learning at levels of, you know we're not talking about doing advanced research on spanish etymology or something i, I know there's some other whoops there are some other resources you might need if there are some other uh, research purposes you've got. But you know, um, you know, I know. I'm just being real. I know what it's like to be an intellectual when you literally don't own a desk, you don't own a table. It's hard. I, there's still one article of mine on the internet that has typos. And it's because I didn't have a table. Didn't know, like I, I kind of remember. I, I had. I typed it. I was lying on the floor. I just mentioned. <laughs> so there were some weird typos in that that wouldn't have, I'm not saying I make no typos by the way but having a having a desk having a table uh, in that circumstance would help you know but once you have a desk once you have a table what difference does it make if you have a table of plywood a table of oak or a table of solid gold um, whatever it is you want to learn whether it's a language politics history you, whatever, you know you you can buy a pen for a dollar ninety nine. You buy a pen, probably can get one now for twenty five cents. You can buy you can buy the cheapest pen in the world. You can buy a solid gold fountain pen. You can buy a platinum fountain pen. Is it gonna is it gonna help? Is it gonna make you any smart? Is it gonna help you learn Chinese to buy a really fancy pen? Again, sorry, economics, math, whatever, whatever you're trying to learn. You, having a solid gold desk, having a solid gold pen, is that really gonna help you? Out? Now, look, it's not the topic of this video. Oh, good. Some people are shocked that I'm learning Spanish. Be shocked. Cope. Cope with it. <laughs> um, <sighs> talking about money. Sorry. <laughs> it's not the topic of this video, and I am hot, happy to respond to your, your comments, as I just did. Uh but this whole subject unfolds in the shadow of the failure of organized education. And it has taken me a long time to accept just how broken, just how bad university education is. I just talked about this with my mom the other day. And it's one of those things, most people, they, they say it, but they don't really live with the implications. They don't really live according to that conclusion they've come to after so many years of bad experience. They say, oh yeah, yeah the universities are all, are all bad. It's all bullshit. Don't waste your time. And then they turn around and tell you to sign up for a course. So they say, oh, you know, you should go to the university here. It can help you. They say, no, 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 wait, you just said a minute. You have to really live with the implications of how, of how, of how bad it is, of how failed it is. Um, if you believed there was a university anywhere in the world that could help you learn Chinese and tuition cost a million dollars, your perspective on life would be very different from mine because I know as a matter of fact, there is not any university anywhere in the world that will help you learn Chinese for any price, not for a million dollars and not for $5,000, not at the cheapest. There is no help. And I, I say this under other headings, there is no professional help. Now I can't say this about every field of human endeavor. Um, cause I don't know every field, but you know, many people told me before I went to college to study baking, how to bake bread. In case you guys think I'm using baking in some abstract philosophical sense. No, I mean, taking dough and water and yeast and making bread. That's what I paid to study. It was a really expensive college too. 
wasn't the cheapest college building. So many people I talked to in the field said, don't do it. Just teach yourself how to bake bread. It's going to be a ripoff. It's going to be a, it's going to be terrible. And I, I couldn't believe them. I have experience with so many fields, uh, philosophy, politics, anthropology, history. I mean, there's so many fields where I, where I could say something similar, you know, um, but I, you know, I couldn't bring myself to believe it about bread. It's just <laughs> baking bread. Come on. Well, guess what? They were, they were right. You know, but this idea um, that it takes time you don't have is false. This idea that it takes money you don't have is false. And then linked to that idea about money is the idea that it requires an institution that you don't have access to either because you don't have time or because you don't have money or you believe in some conspiracy theory that there's a conspiracy keeping you out of that, keeping you out of that institution. So, you know, guys, I mean, I mean look, <laughs> this is brief. We'll come back to the next time. Video. I taught myself how to read and write Pali, a language very similar to Sanskrit, with a flashlight under a mosquito net in a third world country while working part-time jobs. Like I had other jobs to pay the rent, right? Nobody helped me. No teacher, no Buddhist monks helped me. No professor helped me. No, I rode my bicycle to the fucking library and I did the work. Nobody, you know. <laughs> and my, my access to the internet was very limited too because I was in a third world country at that time. Right? And at that time, access to the, so I just say, this is mostly paper and pen and flashlight. And then I start meeting these people with PhDs and they all know less than I do. And I say to them, and I'm not, I'm not mousy. In some cases, I said it this directly, straight to their face. I can't believe you squandered this opportunity. You had the library I never had. You had the wooden desk I never had. You had the desk lamp I never had. You had all the conditions to support you in this kind of scholarship for years. I never had any of that. And you are a bumpkin, ignorant piece of shit compared to me. Compared to what I managed to do, again, I had to work jobs. I had, I had jobs. I did. I was busy. <laughs> you know, I had jobs. And I, and I had a girlfriend. Oh, there's the, big, there's the big regret. A lot of my time went into the girlfriend I had during those years. It was awful. A lot of my time and energy was heartbreaking and terrible. I would have been better off alone or whatever. Would have been. <laughs> I would have been better off doing almost anything else in that department. But I had a horrible girlfriend that took a lot out of me. Um, you know, look, I've had that conversation with people face to face and I've had it by email and so on. I was like, well, look, I've been spending all this time wishing I could have that desk and that desk lamp and that library card and that institutional support and that institutional education. And here you are, you squandered it. It's one thing for me to say, oh, there's no advantage to being in a PhD program. There's no advantage to being in an MA program. There's no advantage to having access to a, an academic library, an academic supervisor, a professor, that kind of structure. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to really live it, to really internalize it and really accept it. And once you do, that's why you start looking at Aaron Janis as your equal. That's why you start looking at Nina and Aranda as your equal. That's why you start looking at Ali Hardesty as your equal. James Aspie, any of these people, and think, hey, you could do all the same things I do. The grass isn't greener on the other side. There isn't any institution that can help you. There isn't any amount of money that can help you. And you don't really need any more time than you've already got. You know, the, the free time you've already got. What Stella Ray. <laughs> you know, I, I look at these people as my equals who are squandering, in a sense, the same opportunity I had or, or an even better opportunity than I had. You know, and I, you know, I mean this. Like, you know, again, I looked around at all these people in, in Buddhist studies. This is just one example. Could now give a whole series of examples with a whole bunch of different fields, like including like anthropology, you know. And you know, with it, <laughs> look, any intelligent, hardworking person working completely on their own in the 21st century can learn more in two years than you would learn doing a PhD program. And when you put the PhD and MA together, you're lucky if that's six years. I mean, when you, the real number of years people spend getting a PhD and MA, it's often eight years and ten years. You know, the real number of years of their life it takes up. There's a lot of jiggery pokery in how the years are calculated. But yeah, you can meet people who took 15 and 20 years getting their PhD. But if you add together the years for an MA and PhD. And there's a sense in which we all know why. The problem isn't knowing it. The problem is accepting it. The problem is internalizing it. The problem is really living with the consequences. And this leads to 
a kind of radical egalitarianism, paradoxically combined with what I'd call voluntarist elitism. Just gonna burp. What a strange phrase, voluntarist elitism. Okay, you know, if you have a democratic forum, this is easiest to visualize at the level of a city or a small town. Say, so, okay, we're gonna have we're gonna have some more direct democracy. We're gonna have people show up and debate what we should do about things like parking regulations and sewage, all the boring things government does. We're gonna have some more direct democracy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's egalitarian. In theory, anyone can participate, but not everyone does. And let's just say there isn't even a formal exam you have to write. But if you show up at these events to talk about sewage treatment and you haven't done the reading and you haven't done the research, you don't know what the technical terms mean, you haven't been over the blueprints, you haven't invested that level of work, you will be shamed and humiliated and ridiculed. For sure. Let's, let's just say that you could imagine a democratic system where you actually have to study and write an exam to show, yeah, look, I know enough about sewage treatment to participate in this. But we're, let's just say it's just shame and ridicule that you came to the Penex, you came to City Hall to participate. All right. My point is this. You can have elitist systems that don't exclude people. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone can participate, but not everyone will. It's voluntary. It's voluntarist in just this limited sense. Voluntarism, a word that's had many meanings in many different periods of time. <laughs> the, the will is a word that's had many different meanings in many different periods of time, too. Okay, so um, that's the paradoxical, paradoxical sense in which what I'm saying here is both more egalitarian and more overtly elitist. Now, so you guys will know, look, I, you know, I got love for all these people. But I also have contempt for them. There was an anarchist who followed this channel so closely, more than five years, but let, let's say five years. I might be more like seven or eight years. There was this guy, and he was an ideological anarchist, and I was very kind and encouraging to him, despite the fact that he's a jackass, if you can't guess. You know, well, <laughs> here's the thing. You know, I was I was kind and encouraging him for the whole five years, the whole eight years, whatever it was, you know. Whatever my opinion of him was at the beginning of that period of time, you know, five years is enough for somebody to learn a lot. And on any one of these issues that he was, you know, speechifying on on the Internet, that he was speechifying to me about, by the way, too. You know, he this guy cared a lot about the Syrian civil war. It was very much ongoing in those years. It's not really over yet, but still, that was when the, the red hot bullets fly uh, in the Syrian civil war. You know, so he has all these strongly held opinions. It's like, look, bro, I'm looking at you over five years and you're not getting any less ignorant. You're not getting any better informed. You're not getting any more sophisticated. Something's really wrong here. Now, again, I think uh, Matt Dillahunty is a great example of that. Whether you're talking about five years or like 15 years in his case. What's, what's going How is it possible? This guy's a public intellectual looking for it. And you're not... I'm not seeing growth. I'm not seeing development. You should be having breakthroughs all the time. You should be able to say, wow, you know, I, I view this chapter of history profoundly differently, fundamentally differently than I did just two years ago. Now that I've done this reading or this research or now that I've compared it to this, you know, now I see and feel about this in a totally different way. I did more. The life of the mind, you're challenging your own ignorance more often than they're challenging other people's. On YouTube, you mostly see me people, you mostly see me challenging other people's ignorance. Well, I do challenge my own, you know, I'm, I'm in that sense, I'm turning a corner on issues uh, all the time. Um, <laughs> is there a separate conclusion to this thesis? <laughs> um, you know, uh, my point is this, you know, at some point, both for ourselves and others, like on a one-to-one -one basis, ourselves and people we know as individuals, and when you scale it up, and you start talking about a community as a whole. Uh, you start talking about a culture or society as a whole. You start talking about millions of people in aggregate. At some point, you have to stop blaming lack of time. At some point, you have to stop blaming lack of money. At some time, at some point, you have to stop blaming the institutions, whether it's a lack of institutions or low quality institutions. At some point, you have to say, "No, it's on you." And and. This creates pressure because it's on me too. It's all up to me, right? It's all up to you as an individual. And in recognizing that there aren't any insuperable barriers or obstacles for me as an individual 
or for Matt Dillahunty as an individual or for uh, this anarchist guy, I'm leaving on names as an individual, or for Richard Vegan Gaines or for Nina and Randa or for Aaron Jones. In, in recognizing that, right, in, in denuding the situation of these uh, familiar excuses that, oh, you couldn't learn that without going to university, you couldn't learn that with some special advantages in life you weren't, you weren't born with, uh, and so on and so forth, you know, you're then left with this stark realization that the intellectual elite we're talking about is voluntary. You know, nobody chose them. They chose themselves. Nobody appointed them. They are self-appointed. And nobody, in this generation, nobody trained them. Nobody educated them. Either they educated themselves or they just plain remained podunk ignorant. Now, look, I got to say, I've known a lot of people inside PhD programs. And there are people who've told me they learned more from me than they learned from their PhD supervisor. You know, I, and that's, it's not a great boast. You can look at how most people, their relationships, their PhD supervisor, they, they learn, they learn very little. I mean, think about it. You could come to my YouTube channel. You could watch hundreds of hours of lectures from me. How many hundreds of hours did you, did you actually talk to or listen to your, your PhD supervisor? It's not, it's not that, that great a boast seen in that context. But obviously, you know, I was married to someone with a PhD, my first wife, my, my ex-wife. I know she learned more from me than she learned from her PhD supervisor. I mean, I, I know whether or not she'd say that now or whether or not she said it in the past or whatever. I went through that process with her. And I think you can imagine, like, a, it's a reasonable comparison. What is the value of being married to someone and being in love with someone? who's an intellectual and who lives in the same apartment with you and who talks to you every day about what you're reading and your research and the article you're writing and your next research proposal. Now, by the way, I did not, um, I did not teach her Chinese, my ex-wife. I did not teach her uh, Cambodian or Pali. I did not teach her any language. There's nothing really tangible that's simple about that. But those discussions every day, some of them are in your apartment. Some of them are while you're at the library. Some of them are in reading and giving feedback on the chapters of her PhD thesis or whatever. Like, in a sense, if I didn't contribute more to her intellectual development, you know, uh, than her PhD thesis, I'd be a terrible person. Like, what, you know, what's wrong with you? Of course, it should be on a. On a... Again, these things are kind of easy to say. Um, if they're really hard to live with, it's hard to take seriously um, and live with the implications of. Uh, these these kind of all too obvious observations about how little education matters, how little time and, and money matters. And then, you know, <laughs> so look, this comes back to, sorry, I know it seems like a long time ago now, I read you that quote from Seneca. Seneca is saying, all we have is time. And, you know, the greatest is to look back on your life and realize <laughs> that you're already more dead than alive. Your life is more than halfway over and more than half of your time. It's either time you've squandered yourself or it's time, as he said, so other people have filched from you, other people have robbed you of, other people have stolen you. So all feelings I can relate to. I say I was probably influenced by that when I was 11 years old or something. Figure out when I read Seneca exactly. Probably did shape the way I viewed a lot of other things. It's like when on where I got this mentality that you know, time really matters. Um, but you know, once you accept that, once you accept that it's on you. What attitude should you take toward James Aspie? What attitude should you take towards Nina and Miranda? What attitude should you take toward Aaron Janice? The tragedy of the situation, at least with Aaron, Nina and Miranda, is that you know some part of them wants this. Some part of them wants to be an adult who is taken seriously precisely on these political issues. And we can even say precisely on the type of political issues my YouTube channel tended to be obsessed over over the last eight years. You know, like this is exactly what they want. I, I've seen Aaron Janice standing up and giving a lecture, uh, you know, at, at a vegan conference. I'm sure <laughs> I've seen it on video. Nina and Randa know what it's like to stand in front of a podium. And mostly they do this joking, girly thing of pretending don't take me seriously. And I, I, I do think many men live the same way I do. It's not a strictly gender-coded problem. It's not just a problem women have. It's not just a problem good, good people have. A lot of men will get up at the podium and try to joke around and say, hey, don't take me too seriously. 
um, kind of boyish, you know, joking behavior. But in these cases, you know, they whatever, you spend 29 years living like an idiot, and then you hit some kind of breaking point or in some kind of context, you realize what you really want is to be is to be taken seriously. It's to have exactly this kind of this kind of uh, capacity, acumen, intellectual substance, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to read to you guys. If you uh, if you saw this on um, Instagram before you got here, or you read one part of it in the uh, in the description of this video, you already know where I'm going. I got a uh, I got a letter from a, a viewer of the channel, and by the way, I assumed this was an older gentleman. I assumed this was someone at least fifty years old when I got the the message. It's not not worth saying why, um, but he he wrote back later and specified that no, he's he's about nineteen years old. This is actually quite a young man. Melissa, do you want to do you want to jump in? Is it just a good break point where I'm? Yeah. Okay. No, but but is there anything you want to say about? Uh, any issue? I mean, there's no, well, I guess something you're, that you're unlikely to have another opportunity to speak. <laughs> okay, something that I was thinking when you were uh, speaking was that when I was in university, I was shocked when I went from studying science classes. Uh, I was uh, enrolled in science courses, and then I switched to being an English major, and I was spending hundreds of dollars on my textbooks when I was taking mm -hmm. science classes, and in this sense, I understand why the idea comes to mind that education is expensive by default, because when you take these courses, it's really $250 for a right. textbook uh, in chemistry or psychology. for example. And then when I started reading English literature, the majority of the books were $2 online, yeah. you know? So I would order all of my textbooks and, uh, for under $100. Well, Jane Eyre. One ninety nine. Yeah. yeah right. Well, my Virginia Woolf class, all of those books were a right. dollar each or something, you know. So, uh, look, I know you don't you don't learn the same material, but in learning languages, um, you know, I had right. to I had you hold up that that yeah. uh, Chinese for beginners is book. Fifty cents. Yeah, this is the like right. three editions ago version of the textbook that they're teaching Chinese right now at University of Victoria. Yeah. That was. Like yeah. forty dollars for for an old edition, you know, I, it it isn't necessarily about getting the best, and not not it's not about um, getting the most recent or right. like well, the I, state I just, of the art. You know? I just want to clarify something, please. Melissa, he is here talking about the perception that learning costs money, the perception that the life of the minds costs money. That's very different from the actual cost. It's just, 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 just a footnote, but I mean, it, what she's saying is true. This is why people perceive it as expensive, perhaps. Perhaps some people it's seeing, but uh, the only thing I add is though, I, I do think it's mostly the excuse making mentality. And uh, I, an, oh, yeah. an imperfect parallel, but a real one. Some of you may know fat people and they say, oh, well, if I were rich like you, I'd be thin. If I could afford to exercise. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just to be fair, some sports do require a lot of money. If you, a sailboat, sailing costs money. You know, I, I think fencing, sword fighting costs money. Like, I think some sports are, but if you're talking about diet and exercise and weight loss, I mean, I think we all know that is really an excuse making mechanism. But a lot of fat people do that. A lot of people blame and hate others and say, well, you're thin and I'm fat because of poverty versus wealth. I, I think that's the most fundamental thing. Melissa's mentioned with the perception that this is uh, this is expensive. Well, I'm sure. But I, I really did like the, you know, I really do appreciate the conversation about the cost of time in your life. Yes. And ultimately, it costs nothing to ask a question. It costs nothing to look for answers from people that you know. Uh, <clears throat> however, um, I, there's something in the, the value of being able to decipher what is a useful textbook or a useful uh, website, being able to, de to determine whether this is a good use of your time, that it kind of has to come from going through the process maybe of, of you know, questioning, examining, is questioning your own life. And it's really, you know, this idea of the life of the mind includes questioning and examining what you're doing with your time. I really think yeah, that's so, a fundamental thing. So I, I, I agree with that. I just, I just don't think money helps. I don't, I don't think university helps. So I mean, I think what you're saying is yeah, true, yeah. but sadly you, you can meet people who've had elite education, again, Cambridge, Oxford, et cetera, who never got that. And you can right. meet people who never had any formal 
education who get it, that the, the, the term I like to use is doubt. I talk a lot about doubt in a positive way, being able to, to doubt things and question things. But you can have all of your textbooks handed to you by a professor at an elite university, right. or you can be, you know, you can be someone who never went to university, but who also just uncritically receives yes. books and reasons why it doesn't really question. So if you guys didn't see, I, I said on Instagram recently, um, you know, books are written by complicated people with complicated motivations. There's no such thing as a simple book about the history of World War II. Oh, I just want a simple introduction to the history of World War II. There's no such thing as a simple book on ecology. I think ecology is a great yeah. example. Just like, can you get anything about ecology that isn't propaganda, you know, that isn't pushing several different agendas in the same book, frankly, you know what I mean? I, as a vegan, you guys will, some of you will relate to that, whether or not you're a vegan, some of you are. You know, but you know, books are written by complicated people with complicated motivations. The authors themselves may not know those motivations, but you as a person buying and reading the book, you may be even more deceived. But yeah, that kind of doubt um, that I, I'm just popping in to say I, that's not something you can buy. It's definitely not something you receive from organized education. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I, um, I have a couple of things to say there in response, but I've now asked several different people who majored in environmental science type degrees for recommendations for introductions to ecology. And none of them want to recommend anything to me because they yeah, all right. were able to see that what they were right. required to read for their right. courses was just crap. The same, same thing even with nutrition, nutritional science. Yeah. yeah. Just as an example. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, just given that we yeah. have been able to think these things through over time. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that the conversations that I heard on the news, um, maybe it was, it was more, progressive news that I was listening to maybe five or six years ago uh, was about the value of education. And, you know, Bernie Sanders was all about making education less expensive because everybody deserves to have a bachelor's degree. Everybody deserves to have this opportunity. Um, and there was yeah. the concept that I grew up with was, you know, you can't, or you, you ought not to, um, critique people for being uneducated because you don't know their circumstances. Perhaps they grew up poor. And, and this is really getting to the opposite conclusion is that you don't need to be wealthy in order to, to build up this ability to have doubt, you know, to, right. to yeah. examine your life, life around you. Um, uh, one book that costs $20 could be invaluable to you. Um, one, one book that costs $2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. yeah, sure. <laughs> or one one book you download for free on the internet. But yeah, yeah go on. but I'm just thinking of, yeah. uh, in particular, uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic. This, this yes. book that's discussing uh, psychiatric uh, medications. You know, I was just mentioned that book I quoted you guys from uh, Seneca. Uh, so an hour ago, less than one dollar. <laughs> However, I don't like the translation. I might pay more for a better translation, but that that one is less than one dollar. <laughs> yeah, but you know this that anatomy of an epidemic book talks about people who grow up in poverty, people who yes. grow up in foster going right. in and out of foster homes. They are poor, you know, they are so poor, but they still are prescribed these psychiatric medications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they yeah. know something's wrong, but they just don't understand it. You know? So yeah, just yeah. one book yeah. like this can really yeah. change your perspective, your perception of even just, you know, what medications you've been taking your whole life. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, it sounds stupid, but it's not, what is medicine? What is science? You know, what is politics? I mean, those are really big foundational things. And uh, I don't and know. At, and at university, you're not going to no. get that input. You know? No, 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 no. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to do the thinking for you, and no one's going to ask the questions for you. On the contrary, I mean, the main thing you learn at university is uh, conformism, is uh, you know, to, to unquestioningly follow the dictates of authority figures and to repeat back to them their own opinions. This is the professor's opinion. So if you repeat that back on the exam and in your essay, if you mimic the professor's opinions, that's the way to go ahead. I do write about this in my forthcoming book, No More Manifestos. A considerable part of the book, possibly too many pages of the book, are uh, condemning university education at that. But yeah, uh, actually, philosophy of education is one of the major themes of the book. It's a long book, though. It covers a lot more than, than just that. Uh, uh, I said... Um, you know, uh, you guys may not know this book, but uh, Machiavelli. Machiavelli is famous for the book The Prince, but he has another book that's called Discourses on Livy. It's the, so the title of it, Machiavelli is the author. The title is Discourses on Livy. And I said to Melissa, 
the title of this book would better, uh, it, it should instead be uh, Everything I Know About Politics That Is Worth Saying That I Have Learned During My Lifetime. You know, like loosely linked to a few odd quotations from Livy. Like that's that's what the book is. I just call it commentaries on Livy. It's their discourse on Livy. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, in the same way, you know, no more manifestos in many ways. It's everything I have to say about politics that's worth saying. Um, I, it makes me feel like I never want to write another book in my life or another book of this kind. Children's books, creative writing, other kinds of writing, other kinds of other filmmaking and things I want to do. But I'm not planning for this to be a long series of books on politics. I feel like I feel like this is it. And maybe maybe for this decade and maybe for this maybe for this 40 years, maybe when I'm 80. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the next book on on uh, political philosophy comes out. Okay, so as much uh, anticipated, here's this email I received from a viewer of the channel. He says, "Quote, greetings, Eisel. I've been watching your videos in which you criticize easy methods of language learning and encourage original research. I can agree that if I took up these practices for five years, they would change my life for the better and possibly equip equip me to make a positive difference in the world. Yet, as a beginner in both of these fields." I feel somewhat daunted when I hear you talk about professors that knew less about their field of expertise than you did when you talk about false fluency, period. So I, I just um, mentioned something implicit here. You know, <sighs> already in about the year 2000, I thought university was terrible, uh, in the Western world at least, that was this terrible uh, failure and that one shouldn't go around encouraging people to go back to university. And you might not guess this to me, but I was very reluctant. I was very hesitant to encourage someone like Vegan Gaines to go back to university. You know, like, you know, I know how bad and disappointing and demoralizing, and discouraging a university in Canada is and university in, in most of the Western world is. So I'm not someone who goes around uncritically lauding or recommending university education. I'm very, very hesitant to do so. However, I have met a few people, and uh, you know, Richard might be one of them. Vegan Gaines might be one of them. I have met a few people who were at such a rudimentary level of education and sophistication. We thought, wow, like doing a BA could really help you out. Um, there was one guy who was briefly my roommate. It's not worth telling the whole story, but briefly I was, you know, sleeping in the same apartment as this guy. And I remember like saying it out loud to myself, like, wow, I've never met someone before where I would recommend they get a BA. And like, I would recommend this guy get a BA in English literature, like any subject, like just for this guy to sit down and go through the praxis of reading a book and writing an essay about it again and again and again. This guy is <laughs> he's so fucked up. <laughs> he would benefit from doing that. Now, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, you look at Richard, you look at what he actually did with the last five years of his life. Maybe it would have helped him. I'm skeptical because I know how bad the universities are. You know, it's not, um, put it this way, the fact that you know aspirin works doesn't mean you, rep you recommend it as a cure for all illnesses or all people. Aspirin is good for some people under some circumstances. Well, university, I think, helps fewer people than aspirin, especially in, in, our, in, our, in the English-speaking world, uh, put it that way. But I just point out, you know, another, another recommendation I made to Richard much more passionately and earnestly with none of these concerns was instead that he take his money and fame and go to Syria, you know, and go get involved with refugee camps on the Syrian border, go in in some humanitarian role, get involved in the Syrian civil war. This was a couple years ago at that time, Syria was where the red hot bullets fly, you know, Syrian civil war still not over yet, but the different phase of that of that history. Now, I said this for various reasons. It has to do with who Richard is as a unique person. It has to do with Syria. It has to do with Richard's own engagement with Islam, uh, you know, atheist critique of Islam, and so on and so forth. I can say without any hesitation that, you know, specifically for this particular man at this particular time, and again, he has wealth, he has he has options. Not all of you may be in a position to pack up and go to uh go to Syria, you know. And also, he has a bit of a tough guy complex. You, it's really subtle. You might not have noticed this about Richard, but you know he has a lot of problems related to masculinity and strength and violence. Well, you know, get out in a war zone, 
see how little a difference big muscles make in a, in a, in an epoch when the only muscle you need to kill somebody is a working trigger finger. This is, you know, you change your view of a whole lot of things. But sure, and by the way, I'm not suggesting he would go to Syria and come back with some deep appreciation of Islam, that he'd come back being pro-Islamic or something. But his view of Islam would change. He would gain some kind of nuanced, sophisticated, you know, view of Islam. Now, five years is a long time. What if Richard had taken my advice? It's over five years ago that I made my most notorious criticism of Nina and Randa, the criticism they made a video responding to. We know they saw it, right? It's more than five years ago. I was in Kunming. I remember where I was. What if Nina and Randa had taken my advice? It's about five years ago I started criticizing Aaron Janice. What if Aaron Janice had taken my advice? And I'm, I'm saying this to emphasize. I didn't tell these people to go back to university. James Aspie, I didn't tell him to go to university. Or I don't know in his case if it's go back or go in the first place. I, I, I've never heard him mention that that side of his life, uh, if he has any university education. I, you know, I did not tell him to do this. Aaron Janice, Nina and Randa, they, they are not university graduates. They don't have university education. Um, you know, regardless, my point is I'm actually giving very challenging, very specific recommendations to these people for how they can struggle their way out of their own indolence, you know, into the life of the mind. And at this point, 2022, I'm not merely saying I don't think that's going to be university for everyone. I'm like really saying I don't think it's university for anyone. Like I don't know if anyone is going to benefit from, from uh, university. Because so I haven't asked so far, but if you <laughs> were an hour and 30 minutes in, if you have a second, hit the thumbs up button, by the way. It helps more people find the video after it's published. It also helps more people find the video and join in the conversation while it's while it's going on. And if you guys think I'm at a level of Spanish to interact with you in Spanish, you, you must come on. I've got like a couple days of Spanish in my bones. Level zero, people. Level zero Spanish. <laughs> I guess they were so they were so uh, impressed by my conjugation of the verb bebo. Yes, that's that must be what it is. <laughs> Yo bebo. Ah, tu bebes. <laughs> yeah, Frida is encouraging me. Yeah, well, think about how much Spanish I can learn in just six months. As opposed to how little Chinese Melissa is going to learn. Melissa is working hard on Chinese, but the progress you make in Chinese is so incremental compared to the progress you can make with a uh, with a language like like Spanish. Yeah. Anyway, so Al <laughs> this is the problem. Alec uh, in the audience says, Alec says, "quote I think both a liberal arts degree with an exchange year or humanitarian work in Africa or India would be good options for vegan gains compared to what he's been doing." There's, there's a problem with the last clause of your paragraph there. There's a problem. <laughs> I mean, anything's better than being a video game addict. Anything's better than being a drug addict, you know? Um, you know, but again, I hesitate to say that. Like, you know, I think it's also, uh, I think it's also easy to say for Nina and Randa, they would have been better off going to university than to it. But I, I don't say that. I really know. I really appreciate how bad and how demoralizing and how heartbreaking university can be for me and for them too. Like I really, I don't dehumanize them that way. And, you know, again, they, they won't have the same intellectual pretensions or intellectual ambitions I did when I went to university, but nevertheless, you know, whatever their hopes and dreams are, they can have their hearts bro broken by going to university too. So I'm, I'm, I'm really genuinely uh, sensitive to that. And look, guys, I mean, look, well, I went to learn Chinese at a university, they can't fucking teach Chinese. I went to learn how to make bread at another college, and they couldn't teach how to make bread. Like, this is not philosophy. Like, you know, think about just most of Chinese is just repetition. It's mostly rote memorization and encouragement. I mean, it's it, it's really, compared to a lot of other things, it's so simple. You want to do politics of Cambodia? It's not so simple, you know. Hey, 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 what side was America on in the Cambodian Civil War? Hmm. I've met professors with PhDs who didn't know the answer to that question. Their PhD and specialization was in 
Cambodian politics, Cambodian history. That was all they didn't know which side America was on. <laughs> this is in the 1970s, you know, like, hmm. Uh, there was, oh God, there was another guy who published a book on Cambodian Buddhism. And on every page of that book, there were quote unquote howlers. It's old British slang, you know, what I like to call Santa Claus errors, you know, like errors at the level of you don't realize Santa Claus wasn't a figure in the Bible. You don't realize Santa Claus and Jesus Christ are two different people. You think it was the same person. Like that, ignore that was just published by a major press. And still to this day, it's the main book on Cambodian Buddhism. Anyway, I could, I could go on and on about this. But look, see, again, some of these things are easy for me to say. They're hard to live with. When I look at these other people, whether they are professors or PhD students or people who, people who have PhDs and did something else, didn't become a professor, I have to recognize that they are the product of that same institutional educational system that I'm openly telling you gives you no advantage compared to just taking two years and working really hard on your own. Like if I'm saying that I have to live, I have to accept that. Well, why would you expect this guy to know more than you can live in a tent? Sorry. Why would you expect him to know more than you could know just by living in a tent for two years? You know, like that you, you said that earlier. So now you got to deal with the implications of that. Yes. Whether they're professors uh, or otherwise. And again, by the same token, then you can't turn around and say to Richard, vegan gains, well, Richard, why don't you just go back to university? You'd be so much better off. And again, I know I get it, you know, compared to what he has been doing. You know, I, 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 I'm not, uh, I'm still not willing to say that. Um, I'm not willing to be glib about that. I know how really life ruining and heartbreaking university education can be. And we're, we're not even dealing with the, the economics of it. Okay, uh, I will continue reading this uh, email from a viewer named Jez. Um, so he says, yet as a beginner in both of these fields, I feel somewhat daunted when I hear you talk about professors that knew less about their field of expertise than you did, or when you talk about false fluency. I was wondering if you ever made a video sp that specifically discusses your research process or the process you, you, you use to teach yourself languages. Would it make sense to familiarize yourself with the etymology and grammar of your own language first, or is that irrelevant? So uh, I, obviously I'm going to answer this question now, but I just mentioned I have made videos talking about the language learning aspect in the past, but they're specific to each language. So I know I've made videos talking about learning Pali. I know I've made videos talking about learning Chinese. Um, uh, and I've, I have made videos talking about the critique of and discussion of the philosophy and praxis of learning languages. So uh, maybe he didn't find the answer he was looking for, but that's different videos have approached that issue in, in different ways. And I think most of the stuff about research, those are in videos that are about the meaning of life that just think they don't have research in the title. They say, Hey, guess what the meaning of life is. And then research is like eight tenths of what I talk about in the answer. So that's all I'd say. I mean, babe, you remember this. I'm, I'm not addressing the audiences, babe. Melissa's here. But babe, I, I think you, you'd agree with that, that there are a lot of the videos talking about the meaning of life and how to live a meaningful life. They get into they get into research and what is research. Um, research isn't just something that happens in a lab coat kind of thing. So that's that's where I think that, that kind of material is hidden. Uh, but anyway, I'm not giving this as an excuse or failing to answer the question now. But I just say it's it's been discussed in, from different angles uh, in different videos that way. Um, I return to reading the email quote, I get the impression from watching your videos that whatever methods you use work very well. I haven't heard many people who can talk so eloquently, practically, and meaningfully about the subjects you do. I was unable to find any videos of this nature, but I was wondering if perhaps you had someone was unable to locate. Thanks. And he gives his name, uh, Jez. So, um, the reply I sent him, I was going to reply to you guys now, and I told him I was going to do a live stream. It's possible he's in the audience now. I don't know what time zone he's on. I'll see it tomorrow. Whatever. But I wrote back and said, I'd be happy to make a video or live stream talking about this. But the reality is that I have a lot of experience with failure. Failure is in uh, all caps. And people seem to miss the point that I'm not being self-pitying when I say that I failed and failed and failed. Failure is an important part of the process to talk about, you know. 
and that my current success, success in quotation marks, perhaps acumen or ability would be a better phrase, is really the result of a lot of failure. I, I'm not saying that I learn from failure only, but I think it is a very important thing to talk about. And you're never going to hear that from professors, you know. And even like, to be fair, even if you have a really good personal trainer who's helping you lift weights at the gym, they're not going to talk a lot about failure. They're not going to talk about mistakes they made or misconceptions they had about weightlifting or injuries, like self-inflicted injuries because of things. That mis- that's probably not how they're going to present, you know, the learning process of gaining expertise in, in bodybuilding or, or fitness for you, you know. Uh, but, of course, most of what we know about fitness and most of what we know about nutrition and most of what we know about works in sport, a lot of it does come uh, from failure. You fail and fail and fail uh, before, um, uh, before. Well, I can't even say before you succeed. <laughs> you develop acumen, you develop expertise, you develop, um, you know, capacity in large part through failure. But sure, we're not only going to talk about failure in this video. And I do think there have been quite a few videos about the philosophy of failure, talking about failure and regret and reflecting on that. Not only in relation to research, but research and language learning, you know, being a part of it. Um, so I can say, uh, uh, we're talking about a method honed by failure, I suppose you could say. That's, that's what I wrote part of this message. A method honed by failure. Quote, I have several fans of the channel who are starting, oh, pardon me. I have several fans of the channel who started watching as teenagers and are now becoming scholarly young adults in their 20s. And I wonder how much different their lives will be just because they won't repeat my failures. Mm. Baby, you want to jump in? <laughs> I said you'd be unlikely to get more in. There's here's another reason to get here. I think I think I need to read again just the question part. Uh, yeah. Are you, want, you want me to read to you or what? Sure. Sorry. There you go. Read it from the top. Okay. We'll get your voice for a change. I've been watching your videos in which you criticize easy methods of language learning and encourage original research. I can agree that if I took up these practices for five years, they would change my life for the better and possibly equip me to make a positive difference in the world. Yet, as a beginner in both of these fields, I feel somewhat daunted when I hear you talk about professors that knew less about their field of expertise than you did, or when you talk about false fluency. I was wondering if you ever made a video that specifically discusses your research. Oh, so the question. That's, sorry. That is the question, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, would, would it make sense to familiarize yourself with the etymology and grammar of your own language? Yeah. Words? Okay. I see. Um, well, where are you going with this, Melissa? <laughs> I think it's just, I mean, I understand. I know the the feeling. It's daunting to know that there aren't very many people that you can look up to or that you can look to for guidance yeah. on, on any topic, really, that you have to come, come to this yourself. And, and I remember in one of your videos that you were discussing not not having a religion, but in a sense making your own, like making your own philosophy on life. Not not following any one ideology, but like coming up with your own uh, sense of you know what your philosophy is based on what you've researched and what you've ultimately what you've tried and failed uh, again and again. So I, you know, uh, I just I just want to say like I sympathize with with his position here, where he's like in a you know he's he's a beginner. And you have to realize that there is there are very few experts that you can really trust. Yes. Yeah. So. I, okay. But do you think you can be more specific about what's daunting? So look, I just look, know look, coming look, from look. a Christian background, you know, okay. you want to okay. think okay. that like people okay. have answers and like yeah. you know, I, you know I, that's that's a very okay. But is, thing. is that is that what's it, are you really saying that what's daunting? is that there are no authority figures to look up to and you expect there to be authority figures to tell you yeah, what to do. Well, is I that mean, what's good? Even, maybe that's your answer. I can even think how I used to view uh, medical doctors, how I used to view authority figures in the government. Yep. Just, you know, uh, I can remember the perspective that I had, even in my, even when I was 21, 22, 23, 24, where I felt very intimidated thinking that other people knew a lot more than me. I just by default assumed yeah. that, I was ignorant. I was stupid, but as little as I know, you know, I don't put, I, I don't think of myself as that brilliant of a person. 
Um, I, I'm stupid in a lot of ways still. I'm still very ignorant of a lot of, a lot of topics. But still, when I am aware, when I have conversations with people where I am more knowledgeable just about, just getting back to that topic, psychotropic medications, it's just, it's hard for me to, to recognize. It, it was initially very difficult for me to yeah. cope with that because I thought that older people were more experienced and that older people had more knowledge than me, but I don't. So then the, the responsibility like then falls on you that you have to be the voice, like, you know, uh, it, trying to help people understand yeah. when, you know, you so, didn't want to be in that position. Look, unfortunately, it's kind of a crappy, meaningless song. But there is this song, Be Your Own Personal Jesus. There's no one else to be Jesus for you. You know, um, your situation is peculiar, Melissa. So is the position of Nina and Randa. At some point in their lives, Nina and Randa have had to look at their father and realize this guy doesn't know jack shit. Now, their father presents himself as an expert, <laughs> and he is, he's a kind of community leader. I mean, oh, sorry, if you don't know who Nina Miranda's father is, he literally, he stands on stage, he hosts colloquia, he introduces the speakers, sometimes he's the main speaker himself. You know, but Nina and Miranda's father, they will have seen crowds of people applauding him. You know, <laughs> sometimes they did the intro music, they sang or danced, and then their father comes on stage. They have seen their father having shaking hands with some of the greatest scientists, some of the most respected scientists in the vegan community anyway, you know, certain scientists and doctors who've published books. They've seen him interviewing and being received and, and treated this way. And it must be a very strange break with these fundamentally trusting hierarchical conformist attitudes for Nina and Miranda now as they get closer to 30. I don't know, maybe they're 28, 29 years old now and realize this guy is just a crank. This guy is, if you don't mind me lapsing into German, a Taugenicht. And this guy just does not pull his own weight. Um, and already, I'm sure, for Nina and Miranda, as they get closer to 30 at 29 years old, they must feel that their father doesn't know anything that they don't know themselves, that there's really not a whole lot there. They, okay, maybe he knows how to assemble a radio. You know, whatever you mean. Yeah, I'm not saying there's absolutely nothing, but, you know, in terms of what's really important, what what really matters in life. Now, you know, I know Melissa's parents. I'm not going to turn this into a discourse on Melissa's parents, but I think you get the point. That's a real contrast to both how you view your father as a child. Now, you know, your, your father doesn't have any such claims. You've never seen your father standing up on stage and being an expert. Now, in, in my case, it's an interesting contrast to both of those. Because I saw people who celebrated my parents as great experts, and I always laughed at it. I knew what idiots they were. I knew what a sham this all was. I'd seen my parents on stage. I'd seen people politely applauding. I've honestly, I've never seen a, a crowd that was really thrilled by my parents. So, uh, okay, yeah, it's the, here come the experts. All right, I'm gonna listen to this. Real, I'm just being honest with you. I've never. They probably at some point they've had a crowd that was warmer, but I've never seen my parents really uh, received by a crowd very, very warmly. And, you know, I'm aware, I'm very cynically aware of how little they know. And frankly, their limited, their limited reliability, let's just say, you know. Um, now, anyone else could also just read my parents' published work and come to a pretty cynical assessment of them, but not a lot of people read books. <laughs> um, my parents have published many, many books, by the way, just mentioned individually and collectively. And some of their co-authors on some they, they wrote. They wrote separately. So I just want to say, like, you know, I would presume that Nina and Miranda went through a challenge. Now, some people, they look up to religious authority and they figure out these guys don't really know anything I don't know, or they realize how small the gap is. You know what I mean? Um, I guess I'm kind of surprised that this, I'm, I'm not shocked, but I'm surprised this is the aspect you're drawing attention to as being daunting. Um, so in a lot of religions, you know, you can't know anything. You can't be an expert unless you can read Sanskrit, unless you can read Greek, unless you can read Latin, unless you can read Pali, unless you can read classical Chinese, right? Like there's some very clear demarcation such as language ability, reading ability in a sacred language. And that's what separates the experts from the hoi polloi. 
That's what separates a rabbi from the average man in Judaism. Can you actually read biblical Hebrew? Most rabbis can't. Biblical Hebrew is not easy to read, even if you know modern Hebrew. By the way, It's not that easy to read and understand biblical Hebrew. But in any case, obviously the, the Bible is a heavily studied text, so you get a lot of translations and a lot of, a lot of help with faking it. Uh, I knew one Hebrew scholar. He was not religious, so I got some interesting perspective. I got one biblical scholar who did Hebrew specifically. Um, that was what he did his, his PhD in. Oh, but, you know, once you realize, oh, I could learn that much Latin in like two years. You know, you and I have both worked on Greek. Most and I have both studied Greek briefly. What do you uh, look Greek? If you're just talking about reading Greek, reading philosophical ancient Greek, two years is a long time. Being able to speak and converse and do original writing in modern Greek, five years. That's not two years. It's just the, the being able to use the modern language use it that that rapidly. It's a different kind of job. being able to read ancient Greek on the pitch. Two years, easy. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say it's easy. <laughs> two years of hard work. Okay, and you can. So now, what's what's the gap between me and you? What do you know? I don't know. Now, both with uh, biopsychiatry, you know, antidepressants, psych meds, um, antipsychotic, you know, the, the giving of medications for mood disorders, shall we say, trying to cure things like depression through through pills. You and I both know, and there are studies about kind of how many minutes of instruction. Uh, the average medical doctor, MD, has on this. So in, in the United States and Canada, MD, it means a normal family doctor, not a specialist, not an expert, but it's more than 12 years of education. You know, and you can break down like, oh, this is how many paragraphs they read about this, and this is how many minutes they were instructed about it. But when it's how to handle depression, they know depressingly little. Uh, now, the one that vegans love to talk about is how little um, education they have in um, uh, nutrition, that nutritional science. And you may not know this, there was actually a debate um, in the U.S. House of Congress about making it mandatory to have nutritional education. It's like, well, these guys get about 15 minutes of education on nutrition, and they really don't know anything. So uh, uh, one could insert numerous anecdotes here. But I had a friend, she now hasn't talked to me in years, she's an ex-friend, and she told me this anecdote about her getting a phone call um, from a doctor. So this was a full-fledged medical doctor in France, called her up and he demanded to know how her son was supposed to live, given that there is no protein in a vegetarian diet. She was vegan, but this guy didn't know the difference between vegan and vegetarian. Like, her, your son's going to die because he doesn't own meat. Well, this is formally university educated. So, you know, uh, look, it is interesting to me that that's how Melissa responds to her to say, oh, well, what's daunting about it? You know, you must assume these authority figures have something you don't have, whether that's competence or knowledge or, or experience or something. Well, and, and I mean, it's not the main thing we're talking about this video, but part of being a grown up is recognizing, you know, no, they don't. Or, you know, if they do, is it two years of hard work? Is it five years of hard work? After which you'll know everything they know, or you'll know more than they know. You know? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I agree with you. That should be if you take an optimistic view of it, then that yeah. could be empowering. No, no, but it's easy like, to know and hard to live with. I mean, I think yeah. that's one of those things. Go on, yeah. Yeah, but in a sense, it's empowering to know that you yourself can, right. can learn more. So, yeah, the optimistic view to take, rather, you know, it's just, I agree with you. It's just the process of becoming an adult is is realizing that you have to bear the responsibility yourself of learning things and, and uh, it's it's it falls on you. The responsibility is is only on you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't need to go into it further, but you know, um, in this sense, I, I trusted medical doctors when I shouldn't have, I should have done the research myself, myself, you know, right. I should have trusted kind of that, uh, the skepticism that I had about antidepressants. I should have trusted the skepticism that I had about, um, you know, the medications that I took for many years for controlling my acne, you know, like this, this is the kind of thing that I, I had my own experience of not trusting, realizing I shouldn't have trusted medical doctors and other people in my life, I shouldn't have trusted, you know? So I just say in this way, it's, you know. When you started learning Chinese or when you first considered the option of learning Chinese, because you thought about it for several years before you committed to do it, what was daunting about that? I'm not saying this to contradict you, 
But I would think the answer has nothing to do with what we're just talking about. Maybe wrong, but when you think about learning Chinese, I don't think you envision that in terms of, oh, there's this other class of humanity who are doctors and lawyers and judges and experts and priests, and they have something special about them, whether innately or in terms of education. And that's why they can learn Chinese and I can't. I just, I'm just suggesting you to my knowledge, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that was what was done. What, what, what is daunting? You had like two years of thinking, but maybe I'm underestimating it. It was three years, but some of that, something like two years. And then I was saying to you, look, do you want to do Chinese or not? You know, I, long story short, but you know, but before you, you took seriously learning Chinese, that was a couple of years. Yeah. Maybe um, a year and a half. I'm I don't know. I mean, from the very start when I met you, you, you know, you, uh, <laughs> Give no, me no this is not about me. The point yeah. is what was daunting about it for you. No, because I know you can tell them. I don't want to get into how wonderful and encouraging I was. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, that, that's why I'm suspecting she's getting into it because it's true from the beginning. I was saying, look, if you want to do this with your life, here's how but but I'm saying what was daunting about it. Um okay. Uh yeah, I'll think about it. But I was just going to kind of think about the timeline because uh, you know, I, I didn't actually start writing characters until yeah, or, you know, writing yes. Chinese. It was, when we, it was when we dropped out of baking school. Whether no, no, it was prior to that. Yeah, it was prior to that. I'm just saying, I, it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, I, I just say uh, what was daunting about it is just... <sighs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I just... Trying to become an expert yourself or uh, even reach the level of being a novice in anything it, it's just you know it takes a certain level of um, dedication uh, discipline responsibility that if you don't have it then it's it seems like an immense obstacle but if, if once you start to try and actually do it then no it's not daunting but yeah just say okay so i'm going to give my answer i'm going to use your phrasing you say it's daunting because it's going to take an immense amount of dedication. My answer is what's daunting. And the only thing that's daunting is that you don't know how much dedication it's going to take. And once you do know, nothing's daunting. So like, I remember saying to my ex-wife, Mireille, I've never been less intimidated by a language than I am in looking at Chinese <laughs> You know, it's a very hard language to learn, right? Well, why? I had experience with all these other languages. I'd done all these other research projects. You know what I mean? Now, um, I could say the same about politics and history of Central Asia. So which right now, I have, I've still never done that language. We have a stack of books right here. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, history and politics of this, this part of the world. I'm leaving out several, but, you know, that, that part of the world. Uzbekistan and its neighbors and their relationship to China, right? The relationship between China and Russia and Central Asia. I still haven't done any of that research. I'm not intimidated by it. I'm not daunted by it at all. Why? Well, it's not because I've studied the history and politics of Cambodia or because I've studied the history and politics of Laos or because I've studied the history and politics of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the American Constitution, Napoleon, the French Revolution. It's not any of those things, but I think what's daunting is just not knowing how much work, how much dedication, how much talent or what kind of talent. Well, that's what I think it is. And then when you do know that nothing's daunting. Now we all know I'm an unusual person. Like what I'm saying about myself and nothing's daunting. You can kind of tell, you can pick up on the, on the vibe. You can pick up on the big dick energy to use the gross parlance of our times. You know, you can tell I'm not daunted by this. I can take on any of those things. And there are a lot of different kinds of jobs and real life tasks. I can, I, I, I can take on and I wouldn't be daunted by it at all. Right. But it seems to me that that not knowing that's really the, that's really the problem. Yeah, that's right. And I never, I never right. But but look, oh, okay, okay, but, but see, enough. The problem is the word enough. How much discipline? So like right now, so right now, Melissa, you're at you're at level one, two, or three with Chinese. Melissa's made a lot of progress. I just, I'm giving it a number because what, I'm, level three out of 10 or something. I, I don't know because we haven't tried that. But you know, she's made a lot of progress in Chinese in the last one year. Okay. But as little Chinese as you now know, like as little ability as she has in Chinese, still, 
let's say I was given some kind of business opportunity, some kind of career opportunity linked to Russia. So, oh, wow, I've got this amazing opportunity, but you and I are going to have to live for 10 years speaking Russian. Now, it's very easy for you to estimate and calibrate how much work would be for you to learn Russian. And I think even you can start to feel in your mind what it would be like just to do spoken Russian. Like, okay, I'm just going to work on Russian to be able to speak to people as opposed to I want to be able to read the newspaper. I want to be able to write an article published in the news. Like, you know, there are different levels. There are different aspects to this game. How much vocabulary and how much depth, how much you're here. Like, now, you know, I, so by the way, I also have a sense of how much work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Russian is not easy. But my point is, it's it's finite. So then you have a sense of what is what is enough, right? Now, uh, look, you know, um, uh, for some of you guys will know exactly what I'm what I'm saying here, and some of you won't. I've talked about math this way sometimes, Steve, where like, well, I don't know how much would have to go into math. Well, but I kind of do. <laughs> it's, it's, some ways it's a good example. Some ways it's not. Uh, if you want to master chess, don't. It's a waste of time. Don't master chess. But, you know, some of these things, have you done enough math that you can think about, okay, how much time and energy is that going to get? Or is that totally intimidating to you? Is that totally daunting to you? Because you can't really imagine practicing and building up the ability in, in a particular type of math. So like the math that's used for the stock market is very different than the math we use in political science, social science statistics, you know, or the medical science math or, you know, math used um, just to dole out drugs at a pharmacy you know, measuring uh, concentrations of, of drugs, that is molar math and so on, chem math for chemistry, you know, but the, the, do you know enough to know what this is going to demand of you? What this is, what this can take you? That's my thesis on what's not. Now, I think what you said about authority figures, and as I say, I think respect for your own father, this is kind of classic, but for some people it'll be a Buddhist monk or a priest or something else. What is the definitive you know, authority figure. I never had the illusion that my teachers knew anything more than what was written down in the book they were reading out from. And they didn't really know that much about that. I mean, it was very obvious to me. You know, I, I had a history teacher I liked well enough, but he was very open. He was a he was a beer drinking, sport watching ignoramus. And he he barely knew what was in the history textbook. You know, nice guy. You know, I say I didn't grow up with the illusion that my teachers were well informed, erudite, sophisticated people. I, I didn't. Maybe Maybe my whole life would be different if I regarded my teachers that way, if they'd been the kind of people who could command that kind of respect from me. It's just, it's a finite number of people we're talking about here. You know, and probably some of them watch my YouTube channel. I'm not making a claim that no teachers are intellectuals. Some teachers are real intellectuals, but it's rare. And you may not have had a single teacher who really was an intellectual you could, you could look up to. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, so look, I understand why he's asking here. I understand how it's linked for him as a viewer. He says it seems daunting when he when I mentioned that there were all these professors who knew less than I did in their field, right? Okay, but you're thinking of an abstract professor. You're thinking of like a Lego man. So if you the toy Lego, you get a kind of a man who isn't a particular man. He's a generalized example of a human being, and you put a different hat on him. Now he's a fireman. Now he's a police officer. He doesn't have distinctive facial characteristics, let alone psychological characteristics. Uh, he, he's a maquette. He's a, you know, uh, uh, you know, you're thinking of a kind of non-specific professor. Each one of these professors I'm talking about is a unique human being with his own story. And, you know, I've known them on that one-to-one -one basis. I mean, again, Melissa recently went out to lunch with me and one of these professors and she saw how we spoke to each other. She saw how well I knew him. Frankly, he didn't know me that well. At all. And you saw how ignorant he was within that conversation. There were so many issues in history and politics where he's not remotely on the way. I might as well be talking to a child. I might as well be talking to a, a high school student, you know, and it's in his field of expertise and he doesn't know any of this stuff. You know, I'm totally eclipsing him. Well, that guy has his own story. So look, I'm not I'm not going to talk about that one professor. I'm just going to say about many professors. So like there was one professor I had who was an alcoholic, you know, basically a lifelong alcoholic. He had a PhD, but already that tells you something about him. You know, there many of my professors have been communists. They live a certain kind of life for that reason. They cover their eyes. You know, 
I knew this one professor. I mean, I, I had dinner with her and I had lunch with her, but she wasn't, she didn't teach my classes. She was a professor of Tibetan. She was a very fat, she was a corpulent, grossly obese white woman who had married a Tibetan man and had a Tibetan dog. And, you know, allegedly, I never heard her speaking Tibetan, but I assume they learned to speak Tibetan well enough together, the two of them as a, as a married couple. And then she was this kind of, you know, pathetic shut in, um, you know, and I could talk to her about politics of Tibet only up to, up to a certain level. These are really unique characters with really unique backgrounds. And many of my professors have right away admitted why they were so ignorant. I had one professor tell me his sob story. I've still got an email. He complained that he was born poor and he had to work two part-time jobs while he was in school. And he's a chain smoker and a heavy drinker. He doesn't identify as an alcoholic from my perspective. He's an alcoholic. And then he got married and he had a kid right away. And so, okay, so this is your life. You smoke, you drink, you have a job on the side, you have a wife or who knows what sex life and you have a kid, you have all these distractions. Um, <laughs> I don't want to give away too many details with this guy. He, he had a learning disability that guy, might as well say he was dyslexic and not a little bit dyslexic. He sent me one of his manuscripts for a, for a book. Um, when it, he, the same way he sent it to the publisher, he said, Hey, there's the, I don't know, I don't know what kind of editing team your publisher has. But woo, every sentence there were these crazy errors in. Like his dyslexia was really serious. Okay, well, that's a unique person, that's a unique story. And again, when I mentioned the communism, well, some of them had extreme religious views, you know, they were they were fanatics for one ideology or another, just not communism, it's, it's something else. So, you know, I, I just say, I think the way you, uh, Jez, the guy who remembers, so the way you respond to this, you're kind of thinking about a generalized Lego man professor, a placeholder professor, and not these unique individuals. Now, some other person making this video would say, oh, and I'm sure that those professors, they were wonderful, positive people in their own way who were really good at something, really intelligent at something. There's something else they're really good at. I, <laughs> homie, don't play that, you know? No, I mean, most of these professors, they were terrible people. And a lot of them told me openly about their drug habits and their sex lives and all the ways in which they're terrible people. But I mean, the single most common vice is just laziness and authoritarianism, that once they've become an authority figure, nobody questions them and they don't question themselves and they stop growing and they stop learning as soon as they possibly can. And, you know, I knew professors who were colleagues of my ex-wife and I knew professors who were, you know, connected to my ex-wife and her journey, as well as the ones I've, I've been connected to now at, what, five different universities myself or something. And all the universities where I went and met professors when I was talking about becoming a student there, when I was proposing that I get a master's degree and PhD at different universities. You know, I mean, Melissa, you were with me at that university in LA, right? You met those professors. They're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're human beings. Yeah, I guess I would like to say something. Oh, okay. It might be that I was influenced more by the fact that I was trying to get into science and that I was taking courses where I, I didn't, I had a sense that these people just knew more than me. Like if I took a class on neurobiology, right. I remember one of my professors, he, he was, you know, he was an expert in that field. And then when I did coursework on speech language pathology, I knew that these people, you know, they had right. the skills that built up. So in this sense, like I, I you know, I was still in that mode in my early 20s when I thought that uh, professors really were experts and, and, and so on. So I, I just say, right, right, right. yeah, right, no, I understand, but, but you've had way more experience. No, no, but what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is, is calibrating that. So guys, yeah, I've applied for many different jobs and looked at going into many different lines. Where one of them was bricklayer. How many months do you think it takes to master the trade of being a bricklayer, master the skill of being a, a bricklayer? Depending on what country you live in, it may be generously estimated at three months. In some countries, just three weeks. There are different systems, three weeks of training, and now you're a bricklayer. You know, now maybe you pick up a few more tricks uh, of the trade over the years, but a lot of these things, they are simple. But even something like that, even uh, neurology, let's just say to you, sir, how many years? If you work hard as an amateur in two years, how much can you learn? One of the one of the reasons why that's easy. I know people like to exoticize the sciences. One of the reasons it's easy is that there isn't a language barrier there, and there isn't the same kind of deception that goes on in politics, history, religion. You know, like I'm sorry, but if you want to know uh, Napoleon, 
everybody's lying about Napoleon because everyone's got an agenda, even if their agenda is just to romanticize it. I mean, something, the closer you get to the purer sciences in some ways, the less you just have to deal with those kinds of really distorting bias. I do know, I do know scandals. It's not digress into a bunch of anecdotes about how bad and corrupt the sciences are. I know there are issues, but uh, yeah, not as intense as religion, politics, history. And there isn't a language barrier. If, if your first language is English, imagine if your first language is Laotian and you want to do those sciences, well, first you got to learn English or, or Japanese. You have to learn a, a language that, that those sciences are really taught and studied. In. But yeah, I mean, uh, but for you now, I mean, already neuro, neuroscience, two years, whatever, get the books, do the work. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I mean, you know, of course you could. I mean, you know, well, well, me, if you disagree with me and say it's five years, fine. But you know what I mean? You get the books and start going through it and see, see how much and how little there is to learn. And you, you'll calibrate what the challenge is, how much it demands you. But I mean, to me, I mean, compared to this stuff we've been talking, compared to, compared to learning Chinese, that's nothing. You know, the level of, of expertise, you know, those people have in those sciences. That's really nothing. I'm sorry. Another example that people really glamorize is architecture. You know, and, and by the way, sorry, I have both professionally and in terms of my family, I know a lot of stories of of, uh, of architects ruining building, doing something wrong that has consequences where they were incompetent. And like, I realize architecture, it's an important area to have competence in, but there's not that much to know, <laughs> you know, like even the math used in architecture, you know, calculating the load that uh, each floor has to bear and how the weight is distributed. It's not that hard. It's not that complex. And we want to really glamorize this. And a lot of those guys, whether, however many years they were in school during architecture, but they had two girlfriends and a drinking habit. And it's, you know, the re like as opposed to working for two years uh, passionately on your own, you know, um, you, you'd be surprised at how little there is to know with any of those trades, with any of those specialist fields. So, yeah. And again, you can take this um, as a positive inspiration and say, wow, I can do it on my own. You can become an expert in architecture. You totally can, really. <laughs> um, you know, and of course, it can be incredibly discouraging and demoralizing. We realize nobody is going to help me. I'm all alone. Yeah, it's really, it's saddening. And certainly for people who spent a huge amount of, a huge amount of money. So uh, Reveille is commenting that for topics like neuroscience, although there's an initial mass of information, the main barrier is actually putting the information into context. Um, and so he says, as soon as he sees applications, everything makes sense. So Rewi, I know what you're saying, but my interpretation is different. I think the problem you're describing is that those books are badly written. A lot of books in the sciences are very, very poorly written. And I've been with people also where I'm helping them because English isn't their first language. Often, I mean, what you're saying there, like explaining something in context, that, well, that's the art of being an author, right? Like, how do you, how do you describe to someone how to pick their pocket? How to be a pickpocket. Well, most pickpockets aren't poets. They're not really good at writing a description of exactly how pickpocketing works. They can show you, but it's a different talent. Most people in the sciences, they're just terrible at that. They suck at making it comprehensible. So yeah, and that comes up, I mean, for me as someone who cares a lot about politics, I often laugh out loud with both lawyers and economists because, you know, there's something that's politically important, but the person writing about it is a lawyer or is an economist. Like, oh my God, they can't, they can't, Put the words together in a way that's going to make sense to them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I have experienced that in a professional context too, professional writing and, and professional editing. So, yeah. And uh, in case you hadn't noticed, not everyone's got the gift of the gab to do what I'm doing right now too. So, you know, no, but I, I do think that's, that's the challenge. And, you know, uh, 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 I've known some very stupid people who got PhDs in, in neuroscience. Um, there's one I knew personally. <laughs> So that's actually a story I don't want to tell. There are very few things I've kept private in my life. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, Sam Harris, a complete imbecile. Look up what his PhD is in. So, you know, if you think idiots can't get those PhDs, even in a formal setting, and uh, would it take you two years to know more about neuroscience, more about neurology than Sam Harris knows? I think you could do it in six months. You know, I, I, my point being, Sam Harris is a very ignorant and incompetent person who does have a PhD in that field. Um, so, you know, uh, these things are out there. And, you know, uh, all right. Sorry, I, I, I said this aside. <sighs> um, we've certainly set, <laughs> we've, 
we've certainly established the, the the picture frame very well here now for the picture I'm going to paint, you know, in response to this. You know, so so what a terrible challenge we're all living with. Being in a world where it's all up to you, where it all comes down to the politics of one, the culture of one, standing up and defying the expectations of the society you're born into, whether that be Indonesia, Malaysia, Mexico, the United States, or Europe, where you have to stand up and you have to defy the expectations of your parents, the expectations of your deceased ancestors, the expectations of authority figures, where you have to be someone who's willing to wear unfashionable clothes, <laughs> not because you're uh, not because you're indifferent to fashion, but because you're you're setting your own trend, your own sense of style is uh, is challenging and overturning the fashions of the time. You are someone who is going to transcend the times you live in, rather than you know living your life obeying the dictates of the conformist society that surrounds you. And you happen to be born in a time when the institutions have no wisdom to offer you. They have no help. They have no guidance to offer you. But on the other hand, what used to be the exclusive power, uh, exclusive privilege of being in that institution, it's become readily available via the internet or just on paper. You can order books via, you can order them on Amazon, you know, this kind of thing. It's, it's a book, but you still got that book through the internet. The internet has made book shopping a lot easier and a lot more effective. Well, you know, there was a time when there was just one library you could go to to read a particular book, just to have access to the text, just to have the opportunity to educate yourself. And now you can do that in the comfort of your own home while sitting on the toilet. You know, the extent to which uh, that side of it has been made easier can't be exaggerated. Um, I have said, though, that one of the most precious things is encouragement. And this question is not about encouragement. This question is about method. We're going to talk about method and we're going to talk about encouragement. There are a lot of people making money on the internet giving advice about language learning. Not any other kind of learning, in my opinion. I guess I guess I can think of one channel that was doing the same thing with studying for the med medical school exams. So there, there are a few, but language learning is a big example. There are a few, right, studying for university entrance exams, studying for med school there are a few other little areas where people are making money out of <laughs> offering you the secrets, offering you the key to success in, in, in this kind of study. Um, and one of the comments I've made again and again is that no matter how bad their advice is, no matter how flawed their method is, often what people are paying for and what they're appreciating, what they're getting from it is just encouragement because that is in fact what they really need. What they need is not details on method it's encouragement and with many of these things not all but many you can say well if you're positively motivated enough you're gonna learn anyway no matter how bad the method is so there are limits we can come up with a method of language learning that's so terrible uh that it's going to be counterproductive now uh, there are details if you watch the videos there are details of my advice on learning languages in contrast to other people's advice and you know, my my advice is not going to make me a million dollars. People make people make millions of dollars giving this kind of advice on the internet. Well, I'm not one of them. But just a very technical uh, example. One of the pieces of advice I've given is go to the index of your language textbook and memorize all the vocabulary first. So you memorize, you know, just the the nouns and nouns and verbs, I guess. You know, so you really can recognize and know the meaning of these words first, and then do the language exercises. Now I'm going to get to live up to my own hype here. Babe, could you pass me the book that's under that, that keyboard there? So I have a very boring language textbook here for Spanish. This is brand new. I think it arrived yesterday. Uh, I don't think it has an index. I would have to go through. I wonder if the vocabulary is listed somehow. I'd have to go and extract the vocabulary somehow. Okay, so. Uh, but that would be an example where I'd be saying, okay, memorize all the words first, then do the sentence forming exercises because then anyway your experience of learning your experience doing exercises is very very different okay so there's some very unpopular advice <laughs> i've never heard anyone else i mean i'm just being honest with you I've never, that's how i taught myself paddly I, well it's not the only thing i did but i memorized every single word that was in uh at least three paddly textbooks maybe more and then i did the exercises and then i read the articles and yes i mean so this is not the only field i had experience and it was peculiar then when i met um, people with PhDs in the field who knew so much less than I did. Now, I'm just being real with you. 
all the people with PhDs I knew, and even the Buddhist monks I knew, they also hadn't even learned the alphabet for Pali. They hadn't learned how to read and write the orthography. Different story. So it's, it's kind of amazing how the rudimentary basic elements of learning were being ignored in the 21st century. Perhaps that's true of other fields. Um, perhaps it's not. Uh, so, you know, there is this sense in which method is exaggerated in its importance because it's the aspect that you can monetize. It's the aspect that I can get you to pay to learn on the internet, that different kinds of gurus can say, well, pay me and I'll teach you the method with this simple trick. And then on the other hand, method becomes this kind of mask that's worn over the face of just providing encouragement. Now, again, very briefly, I think all of you would agree this is true with fitness advice. Like what they tell you is pay me and I will treat you the, I will teach you the method. I will teach you the technique of how to lift weights. How much technique is there really? Most people who are paying a personal trainer, it's not method. It's not, to, I'm sorry. If you ever done squats with a, with a bar, like, a, you know, gee, do you know how to do an arm curl? Do you know how to do a bench press? Like, really? You need some, you need to pay someone every week to stand next to you while you're doing a bench press. Well, you do need it, but not for method. You're doing that for encouragement, right? Oh, I've got to be at the gym on time. I've got to be at the gym at three o'clock because that's when my that's when my personal trainer is there. Whatever it is, you're and, and you're doing it partly so that you don't let them down, and you're doing your best. And one of the most common things personal trainers they just tell you to lift more. They just tell you to try it. And if you were there alone, you wouldn't give it a hundred percent. But because that person is there staring at you, you give it a hundred percent. A lot of this you can say about language learning too. Now I'm going to go back. I don't think it's true about life and life. I'll say so in a second. You, you, you know, I said this to Melissa recently. If you join the U.S. Army and you go to their Defense Language Institute, they do "quote unquote" open door study. And they have a guard marching up and down the hall, uh, looking in your door at you once every couple of minutes to see that you're studying. Now you're sitting at a desk. You could be sitting there sexually fantasizing. You could be, you, you know, you can, your mind can be one. You can sit there holding a pen and all you're thinking about is kinky sex or something. You know, there's no, there's no, they're not really forcing you to study, but you know, th th this is an example. Now, are we going to praise this as, as method, as methodology? Again, you, you, it is a method, open door study in the U S military. It's a method, but really what we're talking about here is, is encouragement. And a lot of people need a lot of encouragement. And you can probably say I'm one of these really rare people where I don't, or I don't anymore after the alluded to reality of, look, I didn't start out with all the right answers. I failed and failed and failed. And I learned through a, a lot of failure. I don't need anyone to encourage me. You know, just even at this university, give me the library card and watch me go. I don't need anyone to help me. I can do the research. I can write the essay. I mean, no one has been better prepared for PhD level studies than I am, including my background, by the way, as a professional editor. When I was an editor editing other people's PhD theses, like there are all these things I've uh, experienced with the preparing. Yes, but mysteriously, there's no way for me to get into any master's or PhD program in our incredibly corrupt and broken uh, uh, education system. But look, I, I'm in, in having this brief aside to say, well, I don't need a lot of encouragement. Still, the little bit of encouragement I do need is decisive. It matters. And I recognize most people at every age, you think it's hard at 19. I don't know this guy's about exact age, but he's about 19. The guy who wrote this letter to me. If you think you need a lot of encouragement at 19, how much encouragement do you think 65 year olds need? If you're 65 and you're just getting started on Chinese, you're 65 and you're trying to learn about economics, you're 65 and you're trying to learn about politics and you're 65 and you're challenging misconceptions you've had since you were 19, a false assumptions, you know, oh, oh, you know, you're having to turn those corners. It's very uncomfortable. It's very difficult. People in their 60s need a lot of encouragement to, to develop intellectually. So it's not, it's not just, uh, it's not just at age 19. It's not just when you're young uh, that you need that. But look, you know, um, I got fan mail the other day and I, I responded completely politely and positively. But I got fan mail about my Chinese uh, language education uh, 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 videos. So I got uh, um, someone writing in saying, hey, I really appreciate these videos you did to help people learn Chinese. And he had some specific requests. Uh, most of them use traditional Chinese. He said, can you provide also simplified Chinese? Anyway, whatever. You see the videos. Some of them have both. Some of them don't. But anyway, 
Uh, most of the ones I made when I was in Taiwan, most of them had both simplified and traditional. I remember dividing the screen. So I wrote back in a totally positive, friendly way saying, hey, you know, part of me wants to say, hey, fuck you. <laughs> you know, like part of me wants to say, do you have any idea how much work it is to make those videos? And I get nothing positive back in my life from it. You know, and I don't make those language education videos anymore for Chinese. And I, it's not just that I'm not planning to. I plan not to. And there's real bitterness and disappointment in me from my experience with a whole series of languages. Chinese isn't the only one and what I got back from that study. Now, I've made other videos uh, talking about that. Um, <laughs> so even though I only need a little bit of encouragement, and I'll tell you, during that time in my life, so I was living in Taiwan, let's say two and a half years ago, three years ago, something like that. Two and a half years ago, three years ago. If I had known one person in Taiwan who would have just chatted with me in Facebook messages in Chinese, like helped me improve my Chinese by chatting in Chinese by Facebook messages, that would have been enough encouragement. I could have had one person. If I had known one person who lived in Taiwan and spoke Chinese and was a vegan activist, I would have been so happy to make YouTube videos, not just about language education, but about vegan activism, vegan politics, and Taiwan, all these other interests I have. If I had known one person, I mean, back in my days of doing Buddhism, if I'd known one person in Taiwan, this is many years earlier, but I was also in Taiwan many years earlier, something like 10 years earlier. If I'd known one person who spoke Chinese and cared about Buddhism, they were a scholar of Buddhism or a religious Buddhist person, and they'd help me learn Chinese in connection to Buddhism and some Buddhist temple or something. That encouragement could have changed my whole life at that, at that stage, right? If I had known one person who helped me with Laotian as a language, one person who helped me with Cambodian, there never was even one person. And I got to say this, there never was one person helping me before YouTube. I can't say before the internet because the internet was part of my life before I was on YouTube, but it was a much smaller part of my life. There was never one person encouraging me or helping me before YouTube. And there's never been one person after I got involved with YouTube. And this is not a humble brag. On the contrary, there have only been women trying to fuck me. And that includes the women who were shrewd enough and intelligent enough to pretend that they wanted to help me with my intellectual endeavors to pretend that they wanted to help me with studying languages or sometimes other ambitions I had. Those women also, with the passage of time, it was revealed they were really just trying to sleep with me. They were trying to have sex with me. Um, still good advice. If you're trying to seduce me, <laughs> tell Melissa seduce me. Melissa said she was interested in my writing and so on. But if you're trying to seduce me and you're not an intellectual, pretend, you know, pretend. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm, I'm way more likely to reply to that email if you write to me actually showing interest in my, my writing, my research, my intellectual work, study of languages, you're, you're trying to help me with something. Okay, so look, um, my point is this. I'm saying this self-critically. Yes, I can describe myself as someone with a very high level of capacity to be an autodidact, to be self-teaching, self right? Okay, I can describe myself as someone with a very high level of initiative to just go out and learn things. So, you know, I've been talking to Melissa about this. It's like, look, it can't all be my initiative. Like, okay, like with me, oh, you want to know more about the stock market? You want to have a career in economics? Okay, bang, bang, bang. I've got the books. With it. I'm rolling on it already. And I'm passionate about it even, even though it's not the most meaningful thing about I have so much passion and initiative to put into uh, economics, real estate, law school, film school, filmmaking. Like at any given time, I have all this kind of passion and initiative that I can pour into many different things. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it's one thing. I have all I have all this initiative and I'm not okay. But I would never say I'm someone who doesn't need encouragement. These are counterexamples where I did need encouragement and I asked for encouragement. I was seeking encouragement. I needed people to help me and I didn't get it. And it had a decisive influence on my life, whether or not I'm sad about it. Now, look, sorry, also within this uh, YouTube channel's history. Um, I don't, I'm just being honest with you. I don't think I emotionally feel any kind of way about this, but this YouTube channel is called A Ba Le Ciel. Hilariously mispronounced by Nekakato Avocado. <laughs> With a long history. Okay. Long history of people struggling to pronounce the name of this channel. Why do you think it was called that? Because I thought that atheism and religion was going to be the major focus of this channel. 
I have never had any encouragement from any of the other atheist YouTubers, including ones I reached out to and said, hey, look, I really want to appear on your podcast. I really want to talk to you about Buddhism and atheism like a, or meditation and atheism. There are many different things. I'd love to talk to someone else about it. I'd love to collaborate with someone else about it. I never had any positivity back. I never had, had any encouragement. Now, I'm not going to get into a digression about uh, the, the toxic relationship to myself and the vegans of the 21st century. It would be a, a little bit more lengthy than just saying I never had anything positive. There was a little bit positive, but there was way more negative. It is what it is. But my point is, yes, even for someone like me, encouragement matters. So I'm not diminishing that and I'm not uh, dismissing it. Now, <laughs> Uh, coming back to something Melissa said about an hour ago, and I, I said at that time, okay, I, I will come back to that later. Melissa briefly said that part of the problem is just knowing what to read as opposed to knowing what's crap, knowing what's biased, knowing what's unbiased. Like in order to educate yourself in this way, how, can you even know what to read or how to read it? And that's, you, you know, and then we got into the discussion of, of doubt, you know. Um, and doubting your sources and doubting authority and regarding, you know, behind all authority is mere authorship. You don't regard a book as an authority on a subject. You just recognize, you know, this book was written by a particular person. He was a complicated man with complicated motivations. And, you know, uh, you take it from there, you know, where you really personalize the author of the book and understand, even if the author of the book is trying to be as honest towards you as possible and trying to be as helpful towards you as possible. He or she may not be that actually there may be many different levels of uh, deception and self-deception involved, many different levels of, of dishonesty. I think a great example of that um, is the relationship between Jordan Peterson and an, a notorious book called uh, Hitler's Table Talk. So it's now been proven. So Hitler's Table Talk, this is kind of uh, allegedly the final philosophical statement from Adolf Hitler. What do you know? A bunch of crazy Nazis produced several very different versions of the text because the Nazis were a very eccentric bunch. I mean, they, there was, it wasn't one unified philosophy in that sense. Different people wanted to write or rewrite the words of Adolf Hitler in very different ways. And Jordan Peterson is completely unskeptical and unaware of this. Peterson just kind of, you know, um, <laughs> stumbles through this in a very unsophisticated and, and, and unskeptical way. Well, you know, like, and with this same tendency to rewrite history, um, you, you know, who are you going to find who's really going to be honest with you about communism in China? Who are you going to find? You know, those those simple questions that that kind of doubt and that ability to uh, ability to to oh, the sensitivity to how unreliable your sources are you know, and, and, and developing that. And we've already said that's not something you're ever going to get from university. It's not something that's going to be handed to you by an authority figure. You're more likely to develop it despite university. It's realizing that your professors are lying to you, realizing your parents are lying to you, realizing your priest is lying to you. It's more likely to give you that sense of wanting to interrogate these sources and compare multiple sources and figuring out who's lying, why, who has what agenda, you know, uh, so on and so forth. But yeah, the extent to which things are unknowable just because of that kind of, that kind of bias. That's a huge, huge barrier. And it's not just a barrier to being an autodidact. It's, it's, a, it's a part of the intellectual, the intellectual life. Um, and this does relate, again, to the fundamental question of why learn a foreign language. That wasn't asked here. He's talking about method of learning a language. He's presuming already he's motivated. So language is not just a method of communication, okay? Okay. <laughs> language is not just a way of talking. It's not just a way of reading. It's not just a way of writing. It's not just a way of learning. Okay. A language is a way of thinking and a language is even a way of feeling like there are aspects of sentiment and sentimentality that you only understand through language. And I think that's why anthropology is meaningless. It, you, anthropology being the study of foreign cultures in effect, cultural anthropology of the kind. You know, it's really meaningless when you don't learn the language, when you don't learn to think in that language and feel in that language and perceive the world in that language. I'll give you a really crude example, um, but it, it's a very palpable example. Some some are quite sophisticated and subtle and it takes some time to, to flesh out. In many, many of the languages of Southeast Asia, 
the way for boyfriend and girlfriend to speak to each other, the way for young lovers, like for teenagers to refer to each other, they are sexualized terms that explicitly say that like the male is an older relative to the female. It's like uncle and niece kind of stuff, right? Now it's different. Southeast Asia is a big area and you can look at each language. Uh, both Japan and Korea, this is East Asia, not Southeast Asia, and this weird stuff, uh, not quite older brother, younger sister, but they have these very strange vocabulary. And it's also interesting that in many of these languages and cultures, even if the male is younger than the female, I mean, if people meet when they're in high school or you know, they may be just a few months younger, but um, it's, it's such a common thing in romance in South Korea that it's now used as a joke is for the younger man to say to the, to the female, say, yes, I'm six months younger than you, but I want you to call me older brother. <laughs> I want you to call me. Because then they're like, that's, you know, like, I don't want you to, you know, I want you to look at me as a potential romantic partner. Okay, this is built, <laughs> I don't approve. <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't approve. What can I tell you? I mean, cultural anthropology is fucked up. You know, and you're, you're looking at all this stuff. You know, as an outsider looking in, if you don't actually learn the language and live with language, again, this is a very crude example, right? It's a way of, it's not just a way of talking, not just a way of reading, not just a way of writing. It's a way of learning. It's a way of being ignorant. It's a way of ignoring things, right? Like language also lets you ignore problems, lets you conceal problems, right? But, you know, the way in which family roles and being older versus being younger, age gap relationship, the way that's sexualized and is built into the language and is, and is built into the culture. Okay, something more sophisticated. The whole vocabulary of communist ideology in Southeast Asia was Buddhist. During the Cambodian Revolution, during the Cambodian Civil War, it was Buddhist vocabulary, Buddhist phrasing, and even Buddhist liturgical formulas that were used to teach and preach the precepts of communism. It was explicitly Theravada Buddhist. Now, to, to appreciate that, you've got to study Cambodian. You've got to, you've got to have... I don't approve. It's really fucked up, right? Okay, but you have something very interesting there. Now, already though, look, I've had the experience of studying that. It's not obvious. I also studied Cambodian Lao. Pardon me. I also studied the history of communism in Laos, the history of communism in China, not just the history of communism in Cambodia. Look, can you recognize this? Wow. To an extent that, um, to an extent that an outsider would be unaware of, the way people understood communism in this culture and got committed to this ideology right? It happened through Buddhism. Buddhism was like an intermediate ideology. Huh. To what extent do Italians think about communism in Catholic terms today? To what extent do white Americans in California actually take spiritual terms, whether specifically Christian or broadly hippie spirituality? And think about communism, think about Marxism, think about economics in that way today. Like the exercise, you can see I had a workout doing politics and languages in Southeast Asia. And then I look with a different kind of acumen and insight on our own tradition. And I can see right away, MMT, modern monetary theory, modern magical thinking about economics, left-wing people. Sometimes they're left-wing people buying into right-wing hype, right? Uh, uh, the idea of the government giving everyone a salary every month. This was right-wing libertarianism. This is Friedman's idea. I forget the monthly check from the government. What, what, what do they sell it as now? UBI. UBI, universal basic income, right? So universal, basic, that was a right-wing libertarian idea, but now it's been taken up by the left-wing. MMT and UBI and believing that money is, in, is infinite. And um, uh, the so-called zeitgeist movement, I think we just passed the 10th anniversary. They were huge and all that. Oh, you know, now again, now English is my first language, but in a sense, the distance I have from that by working on another language and another ideology, right? That prepares me for looking at that. Oh, gee, I noticed you guys are actually using deeply Christian or deeply spiritual and magical. The way you're describing this, the way you're setting this up and teaching this, actually, you know, you're thinking about this in this in this religious way. So, you know, th these are examples. Um, my point being, there's a lot there you're never going to really understand or appreciate without working through 
a foreign language. And that encounter with foreign language, foreign history, foreign politics, it very directly deepens your analysis of your understanding of your own history, uh, language, and politics and, and the, the way they, they interact, even if that's only because it estranges you from your own history, language, and politics. It gives you more distance. It gives you more detachment. It gives you more of a gap uh, to work across, paradoxical as or not, as, as that may seem. Um, you know, I've got to say, though, I don't think you can develop as an intellectual by having someone stand over your desk and invigilate you, you know? So this came up under several different headings in this, in this conversation, in this video. I don't think that coercion or supervision of that kind of relationship to authority, I don't think that ever does it for the life of the mind. And look, let's come back to our original examples. Um, I don't think Aaron Janus could have developed in that way being compelled, being observed. I don't think Nina and Randa could have developed in that way. And, uh, you know, I think there's a very simple reason uh, as to why. I think that so much of this kind of learning has to do with doubt. It has to deal with not overcoming uncertainties, but embracing them and exploring them. So very briefly, if you have an army unit, and they've all got to charge at the enemy. They've all got to run into an enemy who's shooting bullets at them. And you're going to actually run over to the enemy side and try to kill the enemy in a time of war. There is a sense in which the commander is, you know, there's nothing to do with doubt or self-doubt or consideration. Hmm, what are the odds, you know? And many periods of our history, this has been a mass phenomenon. Hundreds of men at a time and thousands of men at a time charging directly into bullets whether they're coming out of rifles or cannons, they're firing straight at them. And that's that's what war relied upon. Um, what, you got a better way to fight a war? You got a better way to... <laughs> well, right now is not the time to philosophize about it, you know? So I understand there are circumstances where you're getting rid of doubt and where a certain kind of relationship of authority has to do that. But uh, you can't really do the opposite. You can't coerce someone into doubting and exploring those doubts, that that's something that has to come from within. So I'm not saying the will to learn. I'm not saying the de desire to learn. I'm saying the free play of, of doubt. Now, it obviously applies to these more advanced topics in the life of the mind, politics, history, science, you know, whatever. You know, and just even asking yourself, how do we know that? You know, this author seems so certain that he seems so convinced, but how did he come to that conclusion? What's that based on? It can be just that kind of doubt, you know? You know, and just even ask yourself, is there another school of thought I can I can contrast this to? You know, challenging the implicitly dogmatic thinking that's often built in, into textbook writing or into the writing of history, uh, so on and so forth. You know, um, but actually for me, even with language, I think even in the process of studying a language, is that the way Chinese people really say that? Is that sentence written that way for that reason? Is that character written that way for that reason? The etymology of Chinese characters, there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for doubt. Should I, you know, well, the textbook tells me I should think of this word as being equivalent to this word in English, but it doesn't seem that way to me. Is that how I should think of it? Look, like, I, I know this may seem strange, but there's actually a lot of self-doubt and exam doubting your textbook and doubting examination than whether you Google it or contrast it or ask someone who speaks the language fluently. And oh, and by the way, asking people who speak the language fluently that leads to all kinds of false information. They tell you, oh, no, never say it this way, only say it that way. And, you know, you can get so much, so much false information. So that that's what I'd say is that, um, uh, you, you know, obviously most people are lazy. Most people are not motivated enough. And then it's easy to fantasize about solving this problem by having someone else motivate you or having someone else do the thinking for you. But even with language learning, and even more with the other aspects of the life of the mind. Uh, that's exactly, you, you can never uh, rely on coercion or an expert to, to, to do this for you. It's what you have to do yourself. And of course, it'd say the same about failure, right? Someone else can't fail for you. Like it's one thing to say you have to try yourself. You, you have to have the effort, you have to do the initiative to try. But you also have to have the initiative to get out and fail. And then examine those failures, analyze those failures, 
learn from those failures, right? That's really something. So, you know, um, and it's something you can't buy, something you can't have a teacher do for you or, or any other expert can't, uh, can't provide, provide for you in that way. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, all right, I'm, I'm going to read some comments from the audience. If any of you guys want to want to comment, speak now or hold your peace. <laughs> um, you know, if if so, this is a 19 year old approximately writing to me asking this question. You know, if somebody asks you, "How do you read a book? How do you learn?" I mean, I know it's just partly about language. But, you know, what do you what do you say to someone? He's asking me about how, and mostly I'm answering about why, right? And I think you guys know. I think you guys know I'm, I'm giving this, you know, I'm giving this kind of answer because, you know, I think that the why matters a lot more than the, than the how. Um, and I'll be honest with you too, when I've met people who had the wrong methods, I think it almost always was because they had the wrong motivations. You know, why didn't you question this textbook? Why didn't you question what you were learning? Well, it's normally because you had an agenda. Because you had a, had a motivation uh, leading you the wrong way, and and the maybe the most important part of his answer, pardon me, maybe the most important part of his question, we did talk about at great length, and that was the part uh, talking about overcoming, uh, overcoming what you find daunting about it. We talk about what exactly is daunting about it, and I feel that what is daunting about it is not knowing how much is this going to take of me. You know, you know, another great example of that is swimming. You can met people who've never swam in their life, never learned to swim. Of course it's daunting. You could die. You can drown. Like in five minutes, you can die swimming, whether it's in a pool or in the ocean. That can be the end of your life. Of course it's daunting. You see other people doing it effortlessly. But how much is it going to take out of me to learn to swim? And if you don't have any experience doing anything like that, is this going to be many months of hard work? Is going to be many? And it's it's just the the unfamiliarity of it Pardon me. The unfamiliarity of it makes it inestimable. And when it's inestimable, it's daunting. But sometimes, like I was saying to Melissa, the fact that Melissa has this experience with Chinese means that Russian would not be daunting for a totally different skill set. You know what I mean? And the the experience that I have with Cambodia or uh, the relationship, studying the relationship between ancient Rome and the writing of the American Constitution, that's why it would not be daunting for me to do politics and history of Central Asia. You know, so in in that way, I think that's that's probably the most important uh, part of the part of the answer. But if someone actually asked me the question, so methodologically, how do you study the relationship between Rome and the American Constitution? And even if I say we'll get out there and fail, how do you know when you failed? You know, it's, these are tough questions. You know, or are you going to live your whole life laboring under the delusion that you succeeded when uh, when really you've uh, you've you've failed? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so totally down with question here. Marco asks, uh, Marco is curious to know, do I study pop culture, slang, and street speech when studying a foreign language? So uh, Marco, okay, maybe this is useful to people, maybe that's not. The resources available to me, the materials available to me were very different in these different languages. Um, when I worked on Laotian, um, there were very few books written in high quality contemporary Lao. And I concluded the main thing for me to study was probably Karl Marx was the writing of Karl Marx translated into Lotion. There were not many books written at a really high quality, high level of seriousness about politics or, or anything else. I was like, well, I can read Das Kapital in Lotion. Um, you know, the, the, <laughs> When I lived in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, I was listening to, and, and listening to is misrepresenting it. I was very carefully studying rap music in Cambodia, in Khmer. And I mean, it's a very slow process. So I got the DVDs where you have the lyrics written on screen and they're speaking very fast and you're writing it out. So you have to pause and write it out. And, you know, the, the screen would go to sleep because it's not expecting you to pause it on. So you're pausing, you're writing out shoes, you're, you're doing the analysis and then learning and hearing and hearing the music back. So, I mean, those are two extreme examples um, in terms of what you have to work with. Right now, for contemporary Chinese, 
you know, the lectures of Xi Jinping in Chinese, periodically he gives a lecture, multiple times per year, he'll give a lecture. He speaks very clear, very slow Chinese. Melissa was trying to listen to a news report in Chinese. It was, it was mumble city. It was totally mumbling. And I said, well, how can you listen to this? Well, you know, <laughs> Xi Jinping, when he gives these formal lectures to the whole of China, you, of course, you get the transcription too. You can get it with subtitles. Well, I, I don't mean English subtitles. You get the Chinese right now. But he speaks very clearly. Um, you know, so that's that's a resource you can use. Uh, but, you know, and, and look, sorry, if you're really getting into it, also there's the, the, many of these languages, the relationship between formal written language and local dialect, that can be a big issue. So, you know, do people in the street, is, is the street language of Laos the same as the written language? Depends which street you're talking about because Laos is fragmented into 48 different languages. And, you know, uh, with Chinese, uh, I could go on a big monologue here. Very often the language people are speaking is very, very different from the language that's that's written. So the the theoretical language is very different from the, the practical language. And then you have to ask yourself, how much time do you want to spend on one or the other? And what resources do you actually have? How is it actually possible for you to study uh, one or the other? Yeah. So tough practical questions. Melissa, we have a gap here. Is there is there something else you want to add or a question you want to raise or something else? Because I, I, re I recognize we've partly answered this question and partly haven't. But look, you know, I feel, sorry, for the actual guy who sent in this letter, the main uh, video I'd recommend was why I'm forcing you to read Aristotle. Yeah. So there is a video on this channel. And it is a somewhat meandering video. It is a conversational video. It's not a hard-hitting direct answer. But, uh, you know... Maybe that shows my reckless optimism that you, yes, you can read Thucydides and read Aristotle. I give, I give a specific uh, list of exactly what books you should read, and, and you can develop out of that intellectually. Now, for Melissa, it wasn't easy, but you did the work, and ultimately, you got the results. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I... Yeah, I do appreciate that I had your influence from the start with Chinese, you know, yeah. knew you had already gone through the process of finding resources and, and finding what resources weren't any good. Uh, so I know earlier you said not to digress into how you motivated me to, to uh, study Chinese, but just from the start, you know, you introduced me to Pimsleur, things that I could right. listen to initially to get lang language exposure. So this is... And I was also warning her about how each method had its advantages and disadvantages. You know, you mentioned Pimsleur, but I remember saying, well, look, if you listen to this, here's the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Yes. So from the start, when you first met me, uh, you know, I, I had to think about studying Chinese and, and uh, this process because I had studied German in high school, but... I knew that it would be a different level of difficulty, a different level of seriousness with Chinese, partly because of the difficulty of the language, but also partly because I was living there and because yeah. I was living with an intellectual, I was living with someone who was going to demand, you know, a certain standard of, yeah. you know, intellectual ability. So I, I just say, um, uh, I appreciate that I had your input and I had somebody to guide me along the way. And I, I know most people, I yeah. recognize that most people don't have that. Yeah. So uh, I just say, um, I, I do think that this is a good suggestion that we talk about with the lectures from Xi Jinping, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. you know, because uh, this is just pragmatic. What, what resource do you have? Yeah. But I, you know, right. I, in conversations that I've had uh, where you, you are involved, you know, this, this idea of uh, learning a second language through politics, I don't see it very much online. No. So, yeah, 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 uh, but yeah. I, I right, find it right. really interesting. And, and right. uh, just this morning I was reading, you know, I was listening to the news in, in Chinese trying to, uh, and learning about these different places that I'm already learning about Ukraine and the situation with Russia. But if I learn it in another language, you know, that that just brings more into my life. And, you know, I'm someone who, who enjoys, you know, talking about politics, so I know it's not for everybody. But still, um, you know, I think it's a real world application and it's something that you're you're hearing uh, in the news every day. So, right. yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think you, you were briefly alluding to or, or touching on something there, which I haven't covered at all in this video, which is just, you know, what is your standard for what's good enough? 
And I mean, you said there in passing, living with living with Aslan Lazard, living with a real intellectual, living with this particular intellectual, you knew you were with someone who had very high standards for you. And I think we can all agree that part of the problem for Nina and Randa, part of the problem for Aaron Janis, part of the problem for Vegan Gaines, Richard, is that they've lived in a situation, sometimes they've chosen to live in a situation, but they've been living in a situation where everyone has really low standards for them. Everyone says, oh, good for you, good for you. Everyone's happy that you're childish. Everyone's happy that you showed up. Where no one's demanding excellence of you and you're not learning to demand excellence of yourself. And, you know, um, if you're the kind of person who wants to know what happened with Napoleon, I'm sorry, but it's a good example. Like, oh, you know, I was at the airport the other day and there's this best-selling history of Napoleon. And I bought it and I read it and it was great. That's great. Now I feel like, wow, now I know about what happened with Napoleon. You know, whether you call this methodology or not, no, you have to have the attitude of this isn't good enough. Like you have to be dissatisfied. You know, you have to demand excellence of the authors you're reading and of yourself. I mean, it's not even really just excellence. It's just being dissatisfied. Just knowing this is not good enough. This is just some book I picked up at the airport. And frankly, knowing this, this author is lying to me. He has some agenda. And by the way, the, the author may just may just be a French nationalist. They may just be trying to convince you that France is the most wonderful country in the world. Like a lot of time, that's the bias. Like it's not even something like communism. It's not a clear political agenda. It's just a generalized sense of wanting to glorify France and glorify Napoleon and encourage tourism. Like really their agenda might be they want you to visit certain historical sites in France and tell you how wonderful those are. That can be the agenda, you know. But, um, you know, the sense of demanding more and, you know, this isn't the whole story and something's being concealed for me here, even if it's through incompetence, you know. And that's an attitude you can take to reading science textbooks. We talked about nutrition before as an example. I mean, you know, even seemingly boring factual sciences, obviously to history, politics, and to language also. You know, um, this is what I'm being told. And this is what I'm not being told. Now, you know, I just say a different person could say, well, I had nothing to read at the airport. And I bought this popular history of Napoleon. But I'm reading it. And I know, I know it's not telling me the whole story. You know, the word slavery only appears in the whole book twice. Well, what about slavery? You know, what about Haiti? What about black people? Let's be blunt. What about Napoleon's racism toward black people? And, you know, there was this chapter that made a big deal out of the fact that Napoleon wasn't anti-Semitic, that he had relatively positive attitudes towards Jews. But then, you know, the part that described what Napoleon actually did in Egypt and what he actually did in Haiti and his relationships with slavery and black people and Arabs, you know, it got real vague. It got real evasive, <laughs> you know, huh? You know, like where you're not satisfied, you're demanding more, you know? Um, I, I mean, maybe that's what this whole video should have been about. Like, I'm sorry, this is just coincidental. I'm saying it at the end, right? But I mean, what Melissa has had with me is someone who was tutoring her in having that attitude. So I have mentioned this before, but years ago on the channel, when we went to Greece, so we were briefly in Athens, Greece, Melissa did read and she actually typed out a short history textbook on history of Greece. So it was, it was exactly the kind of book you'd get in an airport or read. It was a general, hey, here's the history of Greece, making it easy for you. Like it wasn't some kind of incisive, hard hitting book. But uh, I said to Melissa, as soon as I started reading it, don't you realize the author is a communist? And she was shocked. Melissa already knew a lot about communism. She'd studied the history of communism in China. It didn't occur to her at all that she was reading communist propaganda about Greece. And I immediately started giving her examples. Only a communist would say this or some far left socialist who's almost a communist. This has real crazy propaganda elements. And so there were, there were many different things about it that were communist propaganda. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things I, I asked was, don't you notice how strange the pro-Turkish bias of this history was? Like a large part of the history of Greece is war with Turkey, you know, ancient, modern, medieval, and every in every period. Don't you notice he's going out of his way to tell you again and again how pro-Turkish he is? And I'm guessing this is fashionable on the far left in, in Greece, right? Now, again, I'm not just 
criticizing Melissa, right? I'm showing her. So look, I'm sorry, guys. I honestly, I didn't think about this till now. It's good. Look, it's great. Most of my videos, most of the time is, is spontaneous. But uh, Jez, this is the most important part. <laughs> it is. This is the most important part of the answer to your question. It took us three hours to get here. And, you know, I think it's true that it has to be applied to the language textbooks, to the lessons, to the reading of history, to the reading of politics, to the reading of science, to everything is this really demanding thing of, of demanding, of, of wanting more of the books, wanting more of your professors, wanting more of the system if you are in an educational system, and wanting more of the books that happen to have, have come into your hands if you're, if you're a self-taught person. Uh, and, you know, part of what's going on there in my mind is, I've said this so many times on the channel, Sympathy is an analytical tool, right? It's unsuccessful. What Napoleon accomplished in Egypt was glorious and successful. Okay, sympathize with the Egyptian perspective, right? Sympathize with the perspective of an indigenous person in Haiti. Well, you can't have said whatever. A black liberated slave in Haiti, someone who was a slave in Haiti. Sympathize with their perspective. Take a moment to, to imagine it. You know, how did they feel about Napoleon? Right? And even, you know, the war between Napoleon and uh, and Austria, you know, oh, this was glorious. This was all wonderful. OK, if you were alive in Vienna at that time, you know, how would you have felt? How would you have felt at this stage? Then how would you have felt at this later stage? Because the alliances shifted over time. I'm not going to fill in all the details here. But like you're going to find flaws in the perspective of the narrator, the perspective of the author, the perspective of the authority figure just by just by thinking that way. Now, you know, um, the way I was able to learn so much Chinese in a short period of time in, in Kunming was obviously of demanding more of my teachers too. And I said, there was a conflict in the school. I said, look, I'm not doing this. I'm not learning this way. One of the teachers, she wanted to give me lessons about driving a car, turn left. It was completely boring. Turn left to the traffic, turn right. She wanted to do these rote exercises. I said, this is not what I'm paying for. This is not what I flew to China for. No, you know, um, you know, and, and I, I had this program. I created my own program where I was writing an essay every day. I was doing original composition and talk about that. I did do rote memorization of vocabulary, but it was vocabulary that was meaningful to my life. And, you know, you were practice. I was practicing speaking, reading and writing every day. But it's like, no, no, I'm not doing fill in the blank exercise about red light, green light, turn left at a traffic, uh, turn left at an intersection. You know, we're not going to. It was big. It was a big conflict. People at the school were really shocked. I'm sorry, I could discover it. it was. It was obviously very upsetting for the teacher. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I think I left a black eye on that institution in a lot of ways. But they also said, I mean, you know, obviously I was one of the best students they'd ever had. I was there. Long. I could see. I could see my competition. I saw people who've been studying there for years, for like five years, and they hadn't learned as much as I learned in five months. You know, I got to see those differences too. Um, but yeah, that's hard because that's that's face to face dealing with an authority figure who says that they're in charge and they're an expert in teaching Chinese. And what do you know? And you say, well, this is what I know. You know that's that's hard. When you're alone with the books, it's not hard in that way. But you have to actively imagine these things. You have to actively imagine there is another perspective here that I'm not hearing. And, you know, again, so with Napoleon, it may seem obvious. Oh, there are two perspectives. So I'll give you an example. You're trying to learn about the history of the Vietnam War. Babe, do we, where is that book? I've never had time to read this. Woo! Yeah, remember this? Remember this? I haven't read one page. It's too late to get that. Have you read one page? Uh, many of the books you have. Most has read some bits. I'm busy. I'm writing a book. I don't think. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to read that book though. Okay, it's really easy to look at Vietnam and think, oh, so there are the pro-communists and there are the anti-communists. Or indeed, many people look at the history of Vietnam and think, oh, there are the communists and then there are the Americans. Allowing yourself to think through first speculatively, first hypothetically, and then to go out and research and see the other perspective. Oh no, there were some people who really believed that Vietnam should be a monarchy. I mean, it may seem obvious, but it's not that obvious. What, were, what was the perspective of a traditional monarchist Buddhist in Vietnam? And that, that there, were, there were a lot of those. Oh, oh, yeah, I guess. And I guess they wouldn't have really supported American-style democracy, and they wouldn't have supported communism, and maybe they kind of felt like modernization in general was bad. Yeah, I guess that must be a significant political voice. 
right? And, and like, oh, wouldn't there have been people in Vietnam who really sincerely were in favor of democracy, but who had some kind of sophisticated understanding that there were other countries around like Japan, like America wasn't the only example to look at and we're watching what was that. Oh yeah, I guess so. And now again, just being able to think about that speculatively, being able to sympathize with it, be able to think, well, if I were alive at that time, this is what I'd be worried about. This is what I'd be thinking if I were living there and then going out and investigating that and getting the other side of it. When I was really a kid, I and mean, this was, uh, you know, I was, I was young. Uh, I was young and, and naive. I remember when I decided to research Spain and the role of Spain in World War II. And I was very dissatisfied with what I found in English because it was a lot of propaganda from different angles. What, which side was Spain on in World War II? Getting, at that time, getting an honest answer to that simple question. What side was Spain on in World War II? And step by step, month by month, you know, there was propaganda written then, there was propaganda written after that. Nobody was all that comfortable in facing up to what had happened in World War II with, with Spain. And, I, you know, I did. I did figure it out. And I remember I researched and wrote an essay about Spanish wolfram. So one of the few things I could find they were being honest about was, oh, well, a big part of the concern with Spain was the control of metals and minerals. Minerals used to produce steel and bullets. And that was a big thing of what the Germans and the British were competing over with Spain. There's more to it than that. But I remember, I did, you know, I'm just being real with you. Why did I do that? I'd already read a lot about World War II, including the history textbooks I was given in Canada, right? And I noticed they were evasive about Spain. I noticed they, <laughs> you know, like they wanted to present the world as neatly divided into two halves, fascist and anti-fascist. Now, they were also very evasive about Joseph Stalin, of course, they didn't want to deal with him in the two. Well, I'm reading all this stuff, and Spain is not a small part of Europe, and the Spanish-speaking countries are not a small part of the world, and there's a big mystery here out in the open, and it's not mysterious because it's hard to know. It's because nobody's comfortable talking, but it's already at that stage. I, I'm just being real. I was very immature, and I was very stupid back then. I wasn't really much smarter than Nina and Randa. I wasn't, you know... Um, but, you know, I fastened on to that and I, I went into that and I tore that apart. So, you know, there's a certain kind of learning that you do maybe by tearing things apart by their seams where it's like, look, I see the crack in this and that makes me question the whole facade. And now I want to know how and why that whole facade was was constructed, you know. So I think I think that's part of learning. And that relates back to what I said earlier, that you can't get this shortcut by having someone else stand over you and forcing you to study that that doubting and when you get good at it, it becomes systematic doubt. It becomes a system. It becomes a method, but at an early stage, it's not, I think it really is just uh, the desire to have more and it's having high standards. And that's why it's so tragic that we have a culture that just cultivates and encourages childishness. Nina and Rand are not the only ones where people are just, Oh, just dance, dance on Instagram, dance on TikTok. You know, enjoy yourself, live life. And with men, it may not be dancing, but just drink alcohol, just watch sports. Think about the extent, and this is childish, drinking beer and watching soccer on TV. This, are, this is not fit for a human being. It's not fit for an adult man. But this is this is childishness. Men, men may be encouraged to go dance in a nightclub. There are some contexts where it's cool for a man to dance. With, you know. But yeah, um, anyway, uh, this business of having relentlessly high standards and asking how do they know that why did they choose to tell me that in that way they being the authors of a book it's not some the people who wrote this book why did they tell me that why are they presenting it that way and you know so i'll give you an example that came up for me recently we know people taking antidepressants and other psychiatric probably all of you do too you know <laughs> like you know um you're reading the official FDA warning for this. This is the American government label, the warning for these drugs. And it admits to you that the cause and effect relationship of this drug is unknown, that the effect of this drug on the brain, its efficacy is unknown and speculative. You know, the etiology of the drug is unknown. 
And the way they word that and the way they present it to you, you know, where what they are saying is we do not even know if this drug has any positive effects at all. And if it does, we have no mechanistic explanation. We don't even have a chemical theory as to what the cause and effect relationship is that gives you that benefit. If there's a benefit and that's a proven. That's being admitted to you, right? But part of what you've got to respond to is the facade. And yeah, there's a crack in the facade. And then questioning, why was this constructed in this way? I mean, I, I guess, you know, on a very simple level, this is, it's a kind of naturalistic fallacy you have to overturn. People sign up to study Chinese and they act like, oh, this is the way Chinese is taught. This is the way I should learn Chinese. So on for every other language. Like if you don't question the authority figures involved, they don't show up and think, <clears throat> okay, about five people had a meeting and decided this is the way Chinese would be taught in this institution. And why did they decide it this way? They're trying to make the most money possible. They're trying to do the least work possible. Uh, I have no reason to think they even compared 10 different textbooks. They probably took the, the most readily available textbook. Maybe it's the most profitable textbook. Gee, why is it $120 for this textbook? They probably didn't look around for one that's a good deal for you. Maybe they only looked at the textbook that would make the most money for them, for the university or institution, right? Maybe they had no interest in that. They didn't do any research about what was an effective method to learn Chinese and what wasn't. They're not evaluating the students coming in. They didn't think about the difference between teaching Chinese to someone whose first language is Japanese and teaching Chinese to someone whose first language is English. There's another five people sat down and it may have just been one or two meetings that designed the curriculum for this course, with very little work. You know, you know what I'm saying? You can accept it as if it's just the rain falling out of the sky. Oh, it's raining today. Some days it rains. There's nothing we can do about it. This is, we just adapt. We just live to it. These are the conditions. As opposed to having that skeptical attitude, five people decided this is how Chinese is to be taught. Now it's to be learned. Now, again, I grew up going to museums. And it's a long story. I went to this one museum in Ottawa. At that time, it was called the War Museum. Maybe now it's called the Military History Museum of Canada or something. They probably, whatever, they probably gave it a better name. But the Museum of War, Museum of Military History, whatever the hell it's called, Museum of the Army in Ottawa, Canada. And while I went around the museum, I was laughing and laughing. And I admit, like, it was a it was an erudite sort of laugh. I don't say, ho, 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 ho. You know, I'm laughing because I know the political history and I know what the government is lying about in this museum. And just just the bizarre and evasive wording. And it was a really good-looking woman who picked me up because I was laughing. She came over to me. She spoke to me in French. And I, I replied to her in French. But this good-looking woman came over and we went out to lunch together. It didn't go anywhere. But this good-looking woman came over and she was like, you know, she first said to me in French and then we started talking in English. Um, she was asking, you know, why I'm laughing. And like, you know, the answer is, guess what? I'm not an idiot. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm too sophisticated to take this stuff on the walls seriously, but you know, okay. A lot of people, and there, a lot of people are going to be bored in that museum because they walk into that museum and they regard the circumstances as being like rain falling from the sky. This is the way it is. This is history. This is the history of world war II. This is the museum. This is what I'm supposed to learn. You know, they sit down in a classroom or they buy a book, whether they buy the book at the air, at the airport uh, bookstore or they take it from a library or take it from Amazon. Oh, this is the history of Napoleon. This is the history of World War II. This is how to learn Chinese. That may also be a book. They're not sitting there and questioning. And fundamentally, how do I regard that museum? I don't regard it as an evil conspiracy, right? I think, you know, about five guys sat down in a room and came up with, what's written on the wall of this museum. I don't think a whole lot of thought went into it. I don't think a whole lot of effort went into it, you know, and probably some of those guys had a PhD in history, but you can imagine, okay, so this is, this is the history of Canada. Um, what do you want to say about the genocide of, of indigenous people? What do you want to say about those wars? It's a war museum. Um, okay. We got to come up with about Five paragraphs here on the on the war and the genocide. Uh, they, they weren't geniuses. They weren't putting a lot of thought into it. And again, th sympathy. Sympathy is an analytical tool. 
What if you were Cree? What if you were Ojibwe? What if you were Inuit? And you're the one reading that. And you have some access from stories your grandparents told you to knowing it didn't really happen like that. You have some, some doubt, at least, you know, that this is, this is so plausible. You know, uh, what, what are we going to say about slavery? <laughs> what are we going to say about the war with the Americans? In case you didn't know, it was a war fought between Canada and the United States, which is now kind of politically inconvenient. Um, Vietnam. What was Canada's involvement in the Vietnam War? And what are we going to say about it? I think five guys talked about it over lunch. And that's part of why this is such garbage. You know, now, this isn't true of all museums. Some museums, there maybe is a little bit more effort that goes into it. Um, but my point is, you know, you're living in a world of artificial and factitious things. I'm, I'm aware it's pronounced factious. But if I say factious, it sounds too much like fractious. So I'm overpronouncing it as factitious, by the way. These are things that have been carefully assembled for you. And in large part, they have been assembled in order to deceive you or in order to reassure you or prevent you asking those difficult questions. Um, now, you know, my point is not that I go into that classroom to study Chinese thinking, this isn't how to study Chinese. I don't go in with the apprehension or conviction this is not the way to study Chinese. That's not my attitude. And my attitude is not, there is a real way to study Chinese. And this is the false way. I can't contrast like, you know, the, 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 the one true God to the false God. That's not my, that's not my attitude. You know, um, my attitude is, well, five guys came up with this method of studying Chinese. I think another five guys could come up with a better method. I think 10 people, could come up with an even better method. And that's the way I look at all institutions. I mean, a museum is a great example. Like, okay, this is what you chose to tell me about slavery, about genocide, about the Vietnam War. And you did that for your own reasons. Again, most of the time, it's not a conspiracy. Most of the time, you just said what you felt comfortable with saying and what you thought parents and children would be comfortable with hearing. You know, and you can imagine some, oh, well, the soldiers fought bravely and everyone tried their best and there weren't too many atrocities or crimes against humanity. I mean, when you put it in perspective, you can imagine what kind of horse shit is on the wall of this mediocre Canadian museum. Um, it, you know, but if you just take this step of seeing that behind all authority, there is mere authorship. You know, there was just one person who wrote this book or five people who worked together and they had their motives and they had their misconceptions. And even if their intentions were good, even if they thought, hey, I'm going to write the best book I possibly can to help the next generation understand what happened in Vietnam, right? That you've got to be in this way, looking at it, at this artificially created facade. And there's something behind the facade. <laughs> there's something else there. There's something concealed by it. And just as sure as there's something revealed by it, you know, there's something that's going to be features and it's going to be exaggerated by it. And that your role is to know better, even at that early incipient stage when all you can do is doubt better. Um, this isn't the best way to learn Chinese. Even if I don't know the best way to learn Chinese, even if I never know the best way to learn Chinese, still my attitude can be... Um, this is, I regard what you're offering me in this institution or what you're offering me in this book. It may just be a printed book you bought, that this is a kind of kludge. This is a kind of um, air sats, half baked concoction put together by a small number of people in a short amount of time. Say, hey, good enough for now. Try it, see if it works, you know. And <laughs> some of you might compare this to the history of philosophy of science, but I think what we're talking about here is in many ways the opposite of science. The history of science is not like this. Um, you know, is the world round or is it flat? Is the world a, a semi-sphere? Is it a <laughs> I'm putting it, an imperfect sphere or is it or is it flat? You, you, with science, you're very often dealing, not always, but you're very often dealing with hard criteria for something being true or false, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with history, with politics, with languages, with most of the things that are involved in life and mind, with judgments about culture, you know, we're in a field where instead it's it's very hard for people to be honest, even when they have absolutely the best of intentions, even when they're not trying to deceive you uh, or anyone else. Yeah, so I, I think I think we did come to a statement about about methodology after all.
after saying all that stuff about intention and motivation and how, how important and encouragement and uh, the reason why, as opposed to the, the question of how, I think that really is the ultimate guide to how to the methodology. And, you know, you have to, um, sorry. So we have someone, we have someone in the audience who knows a little bit about the history of Spain. Yeah. Yeah, Franco, you know, visited Texas and stuff. It was embarrassing and confusing for people. Why are we supporting this guy? How did he end up on our side? What did he do during World War II? Yeah, yeah. and uh, well, I mean, I don't know. What's what's more taboo? The history of fascist Spain, the history of the military dictatorship in Greece, the history of the dictatorship period in South Korea, the history of Cambodia. I mean, there's a lot of post-war, a lot of post-World War II stuff. Where America's position, it's not, it's not, it's not that it made no sense, that it's not easy to make sense of. What why was America on the communist side in Cambodia? Hmm, you know, I know most people don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, Spain in that way, uh, until Franco dies of natural causes, it's one of the great paradoxes produced by World War II and a great deal of discomfort, uh, in retrospect, and while it was and while it was happening. And a lot of left-wing people who want to pose, a lot of left-wing people who want to be holier than thou, a lot of communists who want to make misleading propaganda out of it for other purposes. And a lot of anarchists, too. The anarchist view of the history of Spain is another crazy, uh, distorting, myopic uh, lens to bring to it. Anarchists have a lot of influence in Greece, too. Oh, anyway, yeah, thanks, sir. I'm glad, glad I have some people who read, read books. <laughs> It's not just fans of Nina and Randa that are here in the in the audience today as we pass the, the three hour mark on this on this live stream. Um, yeah, you know, I do think, you know, there's there's a fundamental difference there between seeing yourself in the process of education, passively receiving something meaningful provided to you by experts, whether those are the authors of books or your professors. And seeing yourself as someone who is going to destroy meanings, who is going to find those things meaningful, see what's meaningful about them, and then tear them apart, destroy them, understand their component parts, understand how they were put together, understand the way in which they were meant to seem meaningful, and the way in which they are, in fact, meaningless, or even are intentionally misleading our propaganda, our lies. All my life, my father said to me that the British Empire had accomplished this amazing thing in the abolition of slavery. Some of you are watching this in France, and you can tell me what kind of propaganda you grew up with about the French Empire and the abolition of slavery. But my father 110% subscribed to this view that the British Empire was morally superior to the Americans because of the British Empire's history of slavery. And from my earliest childhood, I can remember not believing him and raising examples to contradict him and say, no, that's not true. You know that can't be true. You know that doesn't make sense. And when I was a child, I didn't know a lot of examples, but I can I, <laughs> give you two. I can remember saying, but what about Jamaica? Now, we had Jamaicans down there. The reason I knew Jamaica existed, Melissa's visited my neighborhood. I didn't have a whole lot of examples to draw as a little kid. I remember when I learned that Sri Lanka existed, it was because of a uh, uh, repairman. I won't tell the whole story. There was one Sri Lankan man in my neighborhood who, who opened like a tailor shop. And I met him. That was the first time I'd heard. I'd never heard the word Sri Lanka or Sinhalese before. Um, you know, what about Sri Lanka? Oh, gee, now we're starting to get a more complex view of slavery in the history of the British Empire, aren't we? Because the first thing I looked up for all these, oh, well, what, how did they abolish slavery there? What actually, what actually happened? Oh, hmm. You know, now, of course, beyond that, who created the slave trade in the United States? I mean, come on, the British Empire was a world spanning. But, you know, my father, as an adult, was still preparing this. And, like, I'm just saying, I understand the way in which that's meaningful to him. It's not entirely meaningless. That's what makes it so dangerous. It's meaningful to him because it gives him a sense of moral superiority over the Americans. It gives him a sense that he was on the right side of history. That, yeah, yeah, the Americans talk about democracy. The Americans talk about their revolution. In Canada, we didn't have that revolution. We didn't, we still don't have democracy. We didn't do any of that. But 
you know, oh, here's this, this great thing you can compensate with by saying, oh, but we were the ones who abolished slavery. We didn't have this horrible civil war, the Americans had. We were so much more erudite and advanced. And guess what? It's not, it's not a total lie. It's not a total fraud. The history of the abolition of slavery in the British Empire is interesting. And guess what? They had colonies in Africa, too. They had colonies in India. It's, it's really ugly once you get into it, guys. <laughs> um, slavery and then indentured servitude in the British Empire. Oh, it's interesting. You know, but, but my point is, what I did was what my father could never do. He becomes captivated by this meaning, this prefabricated meaning, these ready-made thoughts, prêt-à-penser in French. I'm overpronouncing that too. But, but anyway, <laughs> prêt-à-penser in, in Anglo-French. You know, these ready-made thoughts, these meanings that have been presented to him by teachers, by professors, by political leaders, but by books, by textbooks. They say, hey, here's the way to think. Here's the way to understand history. And I'm looking at that and saying, no, I'm going to tear this apart. I'm going to find out what's meaningless about it, what's false or misleading about it. I'm going to find out how it was put together. And um, again, it's not going to be total fiction I mean, most of the time. There's going to be some truth and some fiction. I'm going to find out what's behind it. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to contrast it to competing myths. It's not like a simple thing where you can compare something false to something true. The sciences can be like that. You know, flat earth theory is false. You know, round earth theory is true. Some, some things in science are like that, but this is not like the sciences. You're not going to be able to just contrast it to some other version of events that's true. You're going to be com contrasting mythology to mythology, meaning to meaning. And you're going to tear those apart also and see the components they're made of and see how they've been put together. And then, and only then, you can get involved in the, the creation of meanings yourself, where you understand the raw materials. You understand what it is you're working with. And more importantly, you start to understand the motivations of the authors. And I know it sounds crazy, but that even applies to language textbooks. Why is this language textbook written this way? Why does this teacher teach this way? You know, uh, you know, not just politics and, and history and so on. That's when you start to come into the role of being an author on your own. And again, it's not the, the point is not to perceive everything as the product of a conspiracy. The point is not to debunk everything as propaganda. Books are written by complicated people with complicated motivations. And when you really start learning is when you tear them apart and you start to understand those motivations. And you may, by the end of your study, understand those motivations better than the author, him or herself.